I, I think it, I think war, right? War, war tries to take away your humanity. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think in the, in, in the U.S. forces, at least, we do a good job of understand. We, we understand the independence. We understand we all come from similar backgrounds. Um, we're fighting for a common cause, and it, it allows us never to lose that humanity. All right. Well, if I'm super excited, and I know Sean is too, for yeah. today's episode, we have a uh, you know Captain Brett Crozier. Uh, did I say it right? That's good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, everybody messes up Roby show, so I never always want to make sure. <laughs> but yeah, uh, and his his book. You, if you guys have not read it, uh, Surf When You Can. Um, amazing book about his career uh, as a naval aviator and as a uh, commander, a captain, or commander of a uh, one of only ten nuclear aircraft carriers yeah. in, in the world, or, yeah. or in the world, or in the United States. Right. Well, yeah, the only one. Well, yeah, there's a there's a British French version that's also yeah. nuclear, but. Yeah, we, got, we obviously they have a dominant number. With we actually had eleven now, but nuclear powered and the yeah. biggest, the biggest thing on the seas, as they say. That's, yeah. pre- that's a pretty big uh, achievement, life achievement, and uh, thank you. Uh, I'm sure a, a huge responsibility to burden to, to carry it and be responsible for five thousand sailors. And I, yeah, I don't know, what's what's the what's the value like dollar value to an aircraft carrier w- with all the equipment on it? Is it? It's more than I could afford, but. It's, <laughs> um, you know, they say right now it costs about ten billion to build one. Wow! Yeah. And that doesn't include the airplanes, which gets you up there another couple of billion, and then the people, which are obviously priceless, priceless and then, yeah, and the operating costs. So yeah, yeah, you, you probably are in for I don't know twenty five billion. Wow! Maybe, yeah. which I don't, maybe three of us can figure yeah. that out. Yeah, I, I think I think uh, yeah, I feel I feel like the weight and stress. We have a we have about eight million dollar budget at Mighty Oaks, and sometimes I can't sleep at night. Like, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's funny. I mean, I think the military does a good job of training you for those kind of jobs. And, yeah. and, uh, you know, that was the culmination of my career. So I had, I, you know, I'd spent a lot of time in aircraft carriers at that point. So it was, uh, if I want, I wouldn't say there definitely was stress. There's definitely the pressure, but you feel yeah. comfortable, you know, you feel like you're, you're capable and you have the confidence to do it, which is what you want going into that. Yeah. I, I've heard you talk about this before. We're going to talk about it moving forward, but I, I think the answer to that it, to me is, uh, in, in, is the people you surround yourself by. Yeah, and you know it's if you if you're not surrounded by the right people, you can't do it. If you if you absolutely it, so how much, I guess how much uh, authority do you have to pick the people around you? I mean, a lot of times been in the military, you you work with who you're given, but in this position you're in with that level of responsibility, how much authority do you have to pick your team? Yeah, not not as much like if you were a CEO of a company, right? You you had a lot more authority to pick and choose. Um, yeah, you know, with five thousand people, that means that you know roughly you know twelve to fifteen hundred. Are rotating every year because we're on an average of three-year cycle. So, so you don't get involved in, in the day-to-day stuff. You get to maybe kind of influence, or you get a, a nomination from the military for one of your key advisors, one of your your key departments heads. Yeah, and you get a chance to look at it and and say yeah, yeah or nay, maybe. But for the most part, you know, I, I think the military does, like I said, a good job training people for all those positions. So you feel pretty confident that you're going to get the right okay. person. And if not, well, then then yeah. you you can remove them, I guess, or you could sure. But I think you optimistically you think you're you're going to probably be able to, to motivate and train them how you want them. But, but I mean, yeah. to your earlier point, yeah, life's a team sport. I mean, yeah, you know, there's, there's no one out there. I used to ask my sailors this, like on their first day, you know, give me an example of somebody that's successful by themselves. And the obvious ones were like Tiger Woods and I'm like, well, do you know anything about Tiger Woods? I mean, he's got a putting coach and a yeah. coach yeah. and then this, you know, and you can his list like, and I'm not a his golfer. dad go- groomed him from a kid, yeah, right? So you had like 20 people around him, yeah. not to mention all the business aspect. Yeah. And, I said, and so, you know, the importance is we're all part of a team. Yeah. And if you have the right team and you approach it that way, then and there's nothing you can't do. And I used I, to tell my folks, you know, we could, t- is, with an aircraft carrier, with that much, you know, many people, yeah. whatever, we could take over a small country. Yeah. Now, we wouldn't, but but we yeah. had the, the ability and that means you're part sure. of a pretty strong team and you and with that comes responsibility to, to do your part. Yeah. How, how long is, most military billets are three years. How long is that billet? For me, so that's actually one of the longer ones and that's yeah. by design. It's about, yeah. it's about three years. So you- okay. Um, you know, sometimes less based on the rotation. So it could be as less as, you know, as little as two, but you know, there's always the, the wickets as far as your, your next career move. So, but that is one of the longer ones. I think I've never seen somebody be the CEO in aircraft carrier in probably less than about two and a half years. But you were the XO and the, and then the CEO, is that how it worked? So, uh, so a little different. Yeah. Great question. So the way they do it for us is because we're, we're pilots by trade, right? So mm-hmm. you spend your entire career flying and then you go this path and it starts with, you know, two years of nuclear power school because they want to make sure you understand how the reactor works because that's pretty critical to what you're doing operationally. Then you become the XO, which now means you're the deputy, right? You're mm-hmm. the you're the number two, and mm-hmm. and you're on there for about two years. For me, that was a different aircraft carrier. Okay. 
And then from there, you go on to another ship command. So now you become the captain of a ship, not an aircraft carrier. They call it kind of your training ship. So yeah. I had I had the Blue Ridge, which is an aircraft carrier, also in Japan, about about 600 feet long with about 500 people on it. You do that to figure out how to drive the ship, how to manage the ship. And then from there, you go on to your aircraft carrier command. And you do that you know, for about two and a half to three years. You have an incredible yeah. career. So yeah. we just kind of almost, you know, kind of roughly encapsulated it, but I want to dive into it sure. more. So yeah. who's Brett? Like what, what, you know, what got you, did you, I know you grew up right off an air base. So what made you interested? Cause we're talking about somebody who's a pilot, a helo pilot that went and float fighter jets and now is commanding, you know, yeah. one of the most powerful machines in the world. So yeah. Well, I, I think aviator, right? Uh, so aviator. Yeah. yeah. So um, pi pilots are pilots of army and, uh, air, uh, air force. Right. Yeah. And then, I, I don't. And then Marine Corps and Navy are aviators. Yeah. That might, that might come from Top Gun or something. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but, but we do call it in, in the book. It's, it's Naval Aviator. Yeah. Right? I, I've got, I've gotten, I've never got corrected by a Navy or Marine before. I've got corrected by the Air Force guys. Uh, so um, they're pilots? I, yeah. Well, I, no, I've, I've oh. called it, I called an aviator before and they were like, yeah, yeah. They yeah. don't like being called aviators. Some people don't know what an aviator is. So, that, yeah. that, so you have to be careful. Like you say. I know they're the glasses. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, maybe. That's right. <laughs> so, but anyways, tell us, you, you grew up yeah. in California. What's the, what's the story? So dad was in the air force, um, as a young kid, he was, um, you know, he went to San Diego state from Southern California. He wanted to fly, um, in the air force and then go to Vietnam. He was colorblind and, oh, wow. and he did his best to like memorize those colorblind charts, like the, where you see the numbers and, and, uh, he couldn't, he just couldn't pass it. So, so they, they made him become an aircraft maintenance officer. And he served at Nellis Air Force Base, which is just outside of Las Vegas. So that was kind of my first exposure. I was a young kid. I was born in Vegas. Um, and I just remember probably at a young age, just kind of probably being influenced by big, loud airplanes flying over the mm -hmm. house because we lived on base. And not, you know, I don't have any distinct memories from that, but it kind of certainly planted a seed. And then we, we moved from there and my dad got out and the, the family moved eventually up to Northern California. And there's not a lot of military today, but back then when I grew up, we had Alameda, we had Moffitt, we had Mare Islands, we had submarines. You had aircraft carriers, you had airplanes out of Moffitt. Now it's, you know, there's very little left anymore, unfortunately. So I knew a little about the military, but not like I grew up in Southern California where, you know, Southern, San Diego County has more veterans in active duty than any other county in, yeah. in the U.S. So living in San Diego now, I see what the rest of the world is like. But um, but I always had a fascination for aviation. And I used to draw pictures of it in class when I should have been studying. And I used mm. to save money to buy books about airplanes and and. And I didn't know what that meant, to be honest. I didn't necessarily, you know, I saw this vision and a goal of doing that someday, but much like a kid wants to buy a motorcycle or a car when they turn 16. But, and then, um, but I kept studying and I kept thinking that's what I wanted to do and it never really wavered. So I felt pretty lucky. And then, and then, yeah, I'll admit it now that I'm, now that I'm out, when Top Gun came out in 1986, uh, I remember seeing that movie going, wow, that's kind of cool, actually. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. you're flying, you're at sea. Um, and I didn't know anything about the Navy, but I learned, and then that kind of set me on a path to the Navy and then started with the Naval Academy. So I left, left, uh, Northern California and went to the Naval Academy and that began that career. But, and so I felt lucky that in the end I got to flying, but, but yeah, it ended up being a 30 year career. Um, you know, a lot happened in 30 years, as we know, just from history and, and foreign policy wise. But for me, it meant, uh, I think I did 20 moves in 30 years. Yeah. I raised three boys. What, what year, what year did you go in? Uh, 92. So commission so, 92. Yeah, we were there at 93 for me. Yeah, uh, well, so about same. Yeah, well, you, because you would have went to college first. I went to, I was 17 years old in 1993. You were, okay, yeah. yeah. I went in, so we, yeah. So yeah. We, I didn't mean to cut you off. You no, said no, two, two boys. Three boys. Three boys. Um, yeah. Oldest was in the Navy. Middle son is in the Navy. Youngest is in college now. But yeah, over the course of the 30 years, I mean, I got to fly helicopters. I learned how to, you know, I learned how to fly fighters. I learned about nuclear power, learned how to drive ships. Um, you know, I had you know, lived in Hawaii and Italy and Japan and, and lived all over the States. And, you know, and luckily I picked the right wife who you know, we're going on our, our, our 30th year, uh, this year as well. So, yeah. so a lot of things fell out for me. And I think it just, you know, I, I look back at my career with no regrets and, and, uh, very excited about what I learned. And, and it meant I was, you know, the culmination was the aircraft carrier command of the Roosevelt yeah. on a, on a given day, I could go fly a helicopter in the morning off my own ship. I could go fly a fighter off my ship, you know, in the South China sea. I could jump back on the bridge, drive the ship around the South China Sea, and I could order pizza or whatever I wanted because I, <laughs> I had a cook that would help me make sure I ate when I was supposed to. Well, uh, I want I want to back up, like going to flight school, Pensacola. Yeah, uh, I'm assuming. Like, wh what's what's that? What's going to flight school like as a young person coming out of Naval Academy? How do you? Uh, most people that that go in to be an officer probably don't always get to pick what job they're going to do, but what aviation contract you do. 
right. you don't know what you're going to fly. And so how's that for people listening? I kind of have an idea, but. Uh, yeah, no, great, great question. So when you're generally a junior or senior of, your, mm-hmm. of college, whether you're at the Naval Academy or ROTC, um, for those that go OCS, then they'll get that, they'll get that selection when they enter. So I knew basically my senior year that I was going to uh, be able to fly. I was going to fly something in the Navy. Um, didn't know what, to your point. And that gets you down to Pensacola, which is where, you know, naval aviation starts. That's kind of the birthplace of naval aviation. Um, and you start everything with from learning about the weather. You learn about aerodynamics. You learn about navigation. And you start in, in class. And everything you do is graded and evaluated. Um, and you're ranked amongst your peers. And at some point, then you go from there, from the classroom side to the flying side. And, you know, back then we were flying the T-34, which is a, a single engine prop where the students generally in the front, the instructors in the back. Um, now we fly the T-6 Texan II, which is still a prop, but it's got ejection seats. Good cable. name. Yeah, it's a good name. Good name. Good name. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so that's, that's where they fly now, but you basically learn how to fly. Um, some people come in there with skills, right? They've been flying already because they had a chance before they got there. But for most, it's probably the first time you're ever going to get an airplane. And so you learn anything from how to start it up how to taxi, how to take off, how to land, how to do emergencies, how to fly formation. And that's a probably about, you know, just less than a year of training. Um, and, and it's fun. I mean, for me, I remember I was no longer at the Naval Academy, so I had more freedom than I probably had my whole life. Cause I went right from, you know, home where I had some discipline growing up to the Naval Academy where I had a lot of discipline. And suddenly I found myself in Pensacola and I've got tons of freedom. So some people screw it up, right? Cause they're there and they're like, you know, I can go drink. I can go to the bar tonight on a Monday if I want. And things you didn't get before. So yeah. there's a lot of growing up that takes place for some yeah. folks, uh, myself included. But but I knew what my goal was and I knew what I wanted to do. And so I went through flight school. And after the first phase, so after the first year, they kind of rack and stack you based on your performance. You know, not only how you do academically, but how well you perform in the airplane, which is probably the biggest crucible. And then the number one person gets what they want. And that could be jets. So F-18s or F-35s or Tomcats back then. Um, but what's, you, what's usually the number one person pick? Is there like a, it's got to be a consistent? Like, I, I, yeah, historically, certainly back then it was. I think now it it changes a little bit. Um, you know, because you either you select fighters, you select helicopters, or you select uh, patrol planes. So right now it's the uh, the P eight, which is the the Boeing seven thirty seven version the Navy flies. So more likely they, they're going to pick fighters. I would say most. There there was a long for a long time. There was a draw like the last couple of years to go P eights and fly the Poseidon because they just they liked the lifestyle. They didn't want to live on a ship. Um, so. But I would say if you look over time, over the last 30 years, fighters were, were certainly probably the top choice. And that was my top choice. I just, yeah. I was a number one guy. Uh, yeah. You know, my number one guy was from, you know, Thibodeau, Louisiana, and, and he got yeah. fighters and he went on to fighters. That's awesome. Shout out to, to Thibodeau, Louisiana. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was his last name? You remember? Uh, Brett Odom. Odom? No, oh, what? Not really, not really a super Cajun name, but. Yeah. No, he's <laughs> yeah. not. He's a, he's a good guy. Though. He's yeah. a, um, went on to Harvard, got his MBA, and he does stuff now, but he was a Top Gun pilot as well. And, so that gets you through your first selection. And then from there, you go on to learn to fly helicopters, fighters, uh, or the patrol planes. Back then it was P3s, which is a four engine turboprop. And now it's the P8. And from there, you go to Corpus, you go to Meridian, you go to Kingsville, or you stay there in Pensacola to fly helicopters. And you do that for another year. And once you're done with that, that's when you get your wings. That's your, you know, your wings of gold, as they say. Yeah. And you get your first orders to your first, you know, eventually your first squadron potentially, but what you're going to fly. So back then, if you were a fighter guy, you'd finish, you get your wings and it could be Tomcats. I think we were out of the, the A6 business, which is a, you know, a, a carrier bomber um, or the F-18. Mm-hmm. Now it's the Super Hornet or it's the F-35. Tomcats is the F-14? Tomcats are the F-14. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the original. That's the, that's the Maverick. That's the Maverick yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. The wings mm-hmm. that sweep back and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's, yeah. So that's your first two years. Um, and then now you next thing you know, you're learning now to fly that airplane, specifically how to fight it. So as we say, you know, you Pensacola teaches you to fly, how to fly. Then you, now you learn how to fight it. And so you spend a lot of your time, like, you know, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but when I learned to fly the F-18, flying F-18 is not hard. I mean, it's, I mean, it's easy enough, meaning there's a lot of controls, but it's how you fight it. It's the tactics of how you fight it that become really hard. It's like, you know, shooting a gun's easy, but you know, how you employ that, how you do that tactically is where all the training comes in for guys that are special forces and whatnot. So, um, yeah, so that took me to San Diego for a year of training and then on to Hawaii for my first squadron tour. So by the time I got there, I was an O3, so a full Navy lieutenant in my mm-hmm. first squadron uh, in Paradise, though, flying yeah. helicopters in Hawaii. What, what helicopter platform? So that was the H-60. So it's the Navy's version of the Blackhawk. Ah, oh, okay. So we Is use it them. the C, like C-Stallion? Or? 
No, so you, uh, it's the it, we call it the Seahawk. Seahawk, right? Seahawk, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it's yeah, the yeah. C the C version of it. Yeah, and we have various we have variations of that now as well. So it's a, it's all a Sikorsky yeah. product. Seahawk, um, okay, yeah, Seahawk. Okay. So we would look. You know, our mission was to look for submarines, which at the time were like, why would you know the Cold War was over? It seems like a wasted yeah. mission. Uh, we we look for ships, big ships. We had the ability to shoot, you know, anti ship missiles. But again, that was the '90s, so Cold War was over, and we used to laugh and go, "Man, what? We're not going to do any of this stuff," you know. Right. Um, you know, what are we going to do? And, and so we spent a lot of time flying around the island, looking at surf, and yeah. And then, you know, <laughs> when we deploy, we deployed to the Persian Gulf because it was after Desert Storm, so right. there's still a presence up in that, you know, that area that we're we're kind of still in now. But um, but a lot of my time was the, what I remember mostly is flying around Hawaii, looking at surf, and then. Try to figure out how to get back in time to get my board and go check out the surf spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you knew all the best surf spot as, yeah. a, as a pilot. But but you you went on from helicopters to like you said you went to to the F eighteen. Yeah, is that common that you that guys no. go back? Like I mean, usually you're you're in a helicopter track and that's where you stay. You generally stay, and that's and that's for your own career sake. Like right, you know the the disadvantage is if you transition later in your career, you're going to be behind all your peers. Um, I had the opportunity after my first squadron tour, I did a staff tour, and then I put in a package to then transition because it was something I still wanted to do. I mean, um, I love flying helicopters. I would have done that um, and been happy for 20 more years. But in the back of my mind, I still had that like, man, I still want to kind of fly fighter. I still remember being a kid at Nellis Air Force Base and, you know, uh, and there, my dad was there on the Air Force Base and seeing these things fly overhead. Or I remember the movie Top Gun. So, um, so when the opportunity presented itself, you know, I remember – um, I went home and asked my wife, like all good red blood Americans do, and said, mm. "What do you think?" And uh, she's like, "If you don't do it, you're going to regret it. If you do do it, you know, the best case you'll get to fly them and you'll go on and do other stuff. And worst case, you'll know if it wasn't something you should have been doing." But um, so, with their encouragement, packed up the two boys at that point, and then moved uh, down to Kingsville, Texas, and then learned how to fly jets. And so that goes through a whole another training cycle. So yeah, so now I'm I'm checking in, and all the instructors are actually probably junior to me in rank. Yeah. Um, so you learn a lot doing something like that, right? Like anything in life, you learn, you got to be humble. If you really want to learn something, you better be humble, right? You better not yeah. come in with like, and I've been, I've been in the Navy for 10 years. Yeah. I know what's going on. I mean, and, and you do, you know a lot about what's yeah. going on. You're probably, Navy. 04, you're probably 04 at that time. I was uh, 04 select before I finished that, the next okay. year of training. Um, yeah. but I also remember like, you know, I, I probably learned this from my dad. It's like, there's nothing to be lost by being humble and, and you're going to learn more. You're going to listen more. And people are going to work with you more. So yeah, that was kind of a strategy I took throughout my career and it paid off. And so you go through a whole other thing. You know how to fly. Now you fly something that's faster. And so oftentimes you're by yourself and you fly at night and, and you know how to you know shoot the gun and drop bombs and do some pretty cool stuff. So it was a whole year of training there in Kingsville, Texas, uh, which is pretty hot, by the way, uh, for those that haven't been to Kingsville. <laughs> yes. It's a hot place in the summer. Yeah. And then from there, went out to Lemoore, which is central California, to do all the advanced training in the F-18. Yeah. And so, yeah, so at about the 10 year point, I was probably one of four or five that picked up a transition that year. And that's probably what they still average. So it's a pretty small number. You know, there's roughly um, probably 6,000 pilots in the Navy any given day. So only a couple every year get a chance to do that. So I felt pretty lucky, but I had to be very mindful. Of, you know, I wasn't doing it because I wanted to be an admiral. I wasn't doing it. Because, I wanted to do it because it seemed exciting, seemed like a challenge. And if I approached it right, because I knew that by the time I got to my first squadron, that all my peers that were my, you know, my Brett Odom, who was a peer, you know, my, my roommate and classmate at the academy, you know, he's going to have a thousand hours on me. You know, he's going to have all this experience and not that we're competing, but I need to be able to step up so I can be a contributing member to that team. So they're not looking yeah. at me like, oh, here's the old guy, right? That, yeah. that uh, you know, that doesn't know what he's doing. So I, it put a lot of pressure on myself to do that. And I yeah. had to try to then, um, you know, do all I can to learn. And yeah, then, yeah, perform. Yeah. You talk about that a lot uh, in your book, Surf When You Can. Um so I want to get your perspective on being the old guy in class. Um, I think it's so, it's super valuable, um, but also often um, not sought after to yeah. continue learning as you age. Because when you go into a classroom, you want to feel like the guy that knows everything. But it takes a true leader, a humble person to to be like, no, I'm still learning. So just mm -hmm. share your thoughts on yeah, that. I I'm going to, I don't know if it's Gandhi who said it, but you know, learn like you're going to live forever. Mm. Um, and I think it's human nature to get good at something and then just want to keep doing that and only yeah. that because it's more comfortable. I think, you know, yeah. um, if you can force yourself to accept that, you know, life changes and, and you can learn something and you can grow from that and you, and you approach it from a position of strength, like, Hey, I'm, I'm a good enough helicopter pilot. 
I'm a good enough pilot that I know I can do this and I'm willing to take the step um, and then be humble about it. So you actually learn and aren't, I mean, I think that's true in life. I mean, having just recently left the military, it's my same philosophy. And a lot of people yeah. leave the military and they struggle because they, they're really good at something and they don't know what the next thing is. And that can be intimidating. But if you embrace it and you're like, man, I, I did some pretty cool stuff in the military, right? Like, like most people do. And you approach that transition with confidence, you know, it, it gives you the resiliency and it gives you the ability to try new things. And I'm, I'm doing that now. I'm learning all about like finance and startup world. And I also deal with nonprofit stuff. And that's something I, I would never have done otherwise. And, yeah, right. Uh, but I'm excited by that. And I think it pre presents the opportunities to grow uh, if you approach it the right way and be okay being the oldest guy or being the, be okay. Yeah. When you raise your hand, like, I don't know what that acronym means. What are yeah. you talking about? And I, you know, I, I did a meeting this morning on a finance thing and, and I'm writing down like acronyms that they're throwing out about finance and fixed equity. I'm like, what are they talking about? You know, that I, but I'm looking it up. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. And then once you learn it, you're like, I, I can figure this out, right? Yeah. I figure out how to fly helicopters and fighters and nuclear power. I certainly can figure this out. And I think the military gives you that strength, even though some people don't realize it. Mm -hmm. And you have to approach it like, hey, it's that transition, the ability to grow and learn something new and be okay being the old guy in the class. And if we are, man, the sky's the limit. So you, so you're now you're transitioning. I'm, I got to imagine. I keep that. jumping like 20 years. No, that's okay. <laughs> we're we're going to keep you on track. <laughs> no, that's great. No. Um, so you're transitioning. I mean, how hard was that to go from flying helicopters? to now you're flying, you know, fighter jets. What um, is that? What is, I mean, how hard is it to land on a, on a, what, a 300 foot runway? Uh, yeah, it's pretty I mean, short. Um, oh, that's incredible. So there were moments where I doubted myself. Um, there were moments when I was afraid I'd kill myself because there were things that were hard about it, particularly, you know, land on the carrier. Um, but I always found that, you know, the training is so good. You spend so much time in the simulator with great instructors. That every time I thought I was, I was doubting myself that, you know, I, I'd do just enough or the right instructor would come in and say, Hey, nice job. Um, I, what you'd learn in a helicopter is you learn how to fly uh, with another person, right? I mean, the helicopter, you're in a crew. So you have a co-pilot and you have an air crewman in the back. And so if you're good and you know, as a helicopter pilot, it's because you're, you're work on that team, right? When you learn how to fly a, a jet and especially in training, you're all by yourself. Like. So you're talking on the radio, you're flying the airplane, you're trying to navigate. And I remember I had a simulator once uh, in Kingsville with an old crusty Vietnam veteran instructor. And I did okay in the simulator. And then you open up, you have a canopy, you know, just, you're not moving anywhere. And he sits outside at a desk. And so I open up the canopy and I've got all these stickies all over the inside of the canopy where I'm like writing things down. Because normally when you're flying a helicopter, one dude flies and the other person writes stuff down. Yeah. And so yeah. I had to figure that out. So I had all the stickies all over the place. He's like, <laughs> it's like, you know, you can't do that when you're flying. I'm like, well, until I figure out how to write quickly and fly. Uh, but you figure it out. And, uh, and there were moments along the way though, certainly that were challenging. And, and um, I think what stands out the most for the jet transition was probably certainly landing on land at night on an aircraft carrier because it's just, it's just nothing felt natural about it. Uh, and every, every, you know, cell in your body is saying, that's silly. Why would you land on that old thing? Because it looks like a little postage stamp in the middle of a black ocean and you're all by yourself. There's no instructor with you. You know, there's no instructor in the world that would want to be in your back seat when you're learning to land on a carrier for the first time at night. And uh, and you just have to power through it and you have to go, man, I've been trained for this. I've done the simulator. Trusting instruments. Yeah, you trust your gauges, you know. Uh, What's the room for do, error? Do you lose yeah, like, like peripheral? Zero. You lose peripheral of like you lose sight at, at any point? Uh, I, mean, that, that would, I mean, I don't like know. Just I'm being overwhelmed flown. or like. Or no, just from like, you know, you're, you're, you're like, you're coming down. Tunnel vision. I've never, you know, piloted an aircraft, but I just know from like skydiving and parachutes and, and yeah. like, like I need to be able to see my peripherals of the, the horizon dropping. Like if I'm going to land on something, I want to see that when I'm landing on. Like, I mean, and, there's times when the weather's so bad, you're just following your gauges, right? You yeah. just have wow. little crosshairs. And then you know, with, a, with a half second to go, there's the ship. It all appears like it's supposed to. And you have that, you know, from a half mile out, you do what you can to fly and land. Um, it was, you know, in some cases it was harder when it was like, in that case, you just get on autopilot and you're like, all right, I'm just going to fly. I mean, not, we actually don't fly autopilot, yeah, yeah. but you get in that automated mode where I'm just yeah. going to fly like in a video game. You trust That's, everything. Um, trust everything. It's sometimes it's harder when it's dark at night. Yeah. And it's like, and you can see the ship from 10 miles away. Yeah. And you're like, and it looks like, I mean, it looks like a little speck of light, a little postage yeah. stamp out there. And you're like, I got to land on that thing. And it's moving. Uh, and it's moving and you don't know how much it's moving, but yeah. But then you go, well, that's, that's where I got to go. Cause that's where squadron is. That's where my, my rack is. My food is. And when, so. I, when I say moving, no, it's not, I mean, it's moving cause it's, it's, it's. Or both. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's moving, and it's moving up and down. Yeah. And, yeah. You're generally probably carriers always doing 10, 20, 30 knots or something. Cause you want the wind across the deck. Right. And then the seas are pitching up right. and down. Not always, but, but oftentimes in you which case. To, you have to still land. 
And you, and you don't, ideally you don't worry about it. Ideally you just focus on the landing. You focus on the visuals and you have guys down there that are talking to you like, mm-hmm. Hey, you're looking good. Or Hey, the deck's up. Don't chase it. Meaning the deck's coming up. Don't worry about the fact mm-hmm. that if you see the ship, it looks like the stern's coming up to hit you out of the air. So you, uh, but you do it now. That's what, that's probably the one thing that never gets easy is landing at night on an aircraft carrier. And I yeah. don't care how many times you've done it, how senior you are. Um, like, you know, People generally don't volunteer to go fly more at night for that reason. Uh, <laughs> so, is there a certain sea state that hit, that hits that where you're not you're you're not about to land in America? And for those listening, sea states like yeah, so the conditions of of the the rise and fall of those. Yeah, so it's a thousand foot ship, right? It's it, it's a hundred thousand tons of, of yeah diplomacy, as we say. Um, and for anyone who spends time on the water, you know, you know that any kind of ship can move. But we were we were in places like the Indian Ocean that I think the stern was moving plus or minus twenty feet. So it's moving a lot. Uh, and the, as a pilot, you might not even know it's moving. Yeah. I mean, you, you will, if you're looking at it closely in daytime, sometimes it's worse at night. You're just watching your gauges, but it's moving. So your ship's moving forward. It's potentially moving up and down. Um, and there are times when it's, yeah. So if you were off the coast of Southern San Diego and it starts moving plus or minus 25 feet, you might say, you know, the captain of the ship might say, you know what? It's just not worth the risk. We're just training. Go back, you know, go back to the land at North Island where the field's not moving. And right. it's, you know, 8,000 feet long. But there were times we were in the Indian Ocean that, um, and I always say that because I spent most of my time in the Pacific. We were going from, you know, Straits Ramuz to say Perth for a port mm-hmm. call and you're still flying. And a lot of what we do is called blue water operations, which you means have to land. there is nowhere else to go. So yeah, yeah you, you might be out of limits, but oh well, I mean, you have no other choice. So there's some pretty good, there's a PBS series called Carrier. It's a 10 part series. And for those out there that want to know more about life on a carrier, it's, it's pretty cool, but there's a. There's a segment in there when we on the Nimitz, which was what I was on at the time. And the sea states got so rough that, you know, the, the five or six pilots that were still flying could not, man, like they just, so we had to launch a tanker to give them more gas. So we can launch a fighter that has an extra tanky pot on it and then can give more gas to those guys so they don't run out of gas. Because obviously when they're out of gas, then they just have to eject. Wow. But every time we launched a tanker, that meant one more airplane that was airborne that yeah. was going to have a hard time landing. So you're constantly doing this calculation. Um, but we don't want to, you know, having someone eject in the middle of the ocean at night is not a good option either. But, um, so eventually we, we got everybody aboard, uh, long story short and the video from this PBS series carrier captures it pretty well. Um, cause to the outsider, it looks, it looks harrowing, right? It looks like, man, we're going to lose people. And, and then they go into the ready room and it's a Marine ready room. It was actually a, a 232 red devils, okay. which is a Marine squadron. So they were a sister squadron and they, they go in there to show like, what's the ready room going to look like? Cause half the pilots, are airborne, right? They know these guys and they must be terrified. So they, they show the ready room. And then, uh, of course, we're, we're eating popcorn. We got a big betting table up there. <laughs> That's we're, what I was gonna say. We're placing odds. And <laughs> yeah. it's so, yeah. Odds, yeah. And there's not any inkling that we're doing anything other than watching like a NCAA basketball game trying yeah, to take odds. Yeah. yeah. And then they and they go back to like, there's there's the captain on the ship terrified. Cause I would have been, if I was a captain, I would have been, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, anxious at that point. But the ready room where you're, you know, closest to the fight, as they say. We were just eating popcorn, drinking soda, and 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 making fun of them. And they came down, and yeah. So, <laughs> but that's as we know, that's generally how you deal with stress. In exactly. The military, yeah. Is camaraderie yeah. That's how I was thinking right away. There was there was a there was a pool somewhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, uh, Comedic relief. Is there a, uh, a? I mean, how often does it happen? How often do people burn in and crash in? Uh, we're, we're pretty good these days. I mean, yeah. back in go back to World War Two, we were figuring this stuff out. We were crashing you know every every fight that came back um because we were doing it with old airplanes and not yeah. a lot of instruments back then it's pretty pretty incredible when you think about it and doing it day and night um so i want to say on all my deployments maybe th- we had three airplanes that and that wasn't from landing on the flight deck and crashing it was they had an aircraft issue either in country and they had to eject or they had it around the boat and they ejected before they had a chance to land mm-hmm. okay uh, and that's that's deployed so that would have been you know but none were I mean, it happens. Yeah. Um, flight deck is a very dangerous place to work. Um, you know, remains one of the top three most dangerous places to work in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and it should be. Um, but, but we never, you know, knock on wood, I never had a, had an incident where we were worried about something on the flight deck. I mean, we had things, someone might've landed too far right and their wingtip hit the nose of another airplane, but, um, but you know, there's been, a, but things can go wrong. So you're always, you're always on your yeah. game and, and there's the, the margins of error are pretty small up there. Yeah. That's good to know, at least. So, what happens if you correct? Excuse my um, ignorance, Brett. What, what's what? What 
what are those things called that stop you when you land on the flight deck? What is the, uh, so you've got cables, cables, yeah, 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 resting cables. cables. Um, resting you cables. have three or four and then everything's pretty computerized, meaning that you have a glide slope that you're trying to fly down with very little tolerance. I mean, to the point where it knows you're an F-18, it knows your eye height above the tail hook, the hook that's going to grab the wire. So it gives you a glide slope to fly. It's gyro stabilized and it tries to get you to land right generally between say the two and the three wire. So oftentimes you hear the three wire is what you want to catch. That's because if that system is bringing you down, then it's going to try to get you to your, your tail hook to land yeah, right, yeah, right, right there. Hook. Yeah. So what happens if you miss the cables? Does that happen? Oh, it does. You got to yeah. go, go full yeah. throttle and, and take off. We call the, call the bolter. So every time we land on an aircraft carrier and really when, even when we're back in the field, by default, your, your instinct is to go full power because a lot of things can happen. One, you could land really long, right? And you didn't, you missed all the wires. Um, uh, two, your, your hook could skip. It can hit the metal and bounce, mm. get kind of out of sync with the deck and it can mm. skip over the wires or the wire could break. Um, so if you're, if you come back on the power, you get yelled at like a thousand people will yell at you because you need to be up on the power every time. And the cables are strong enough and they go underneath the deck to these big hydraulic, you know, the, you know, cylinders that pay it out at a set rate that's designed to center you. So it's, the idea is it's going to, if it just stopped you immediately, you would break the jet, right? So it's going to pay it out a little bit, center you on the flight deck. And then put you, come to a stop. Even if you're at full power, it's still going to stop you. It's, it's stronger than than you are as a jet. Wow. But you have to buy, buy have it because all those things can go wrong. You're just by default. You go to military power. Wow. But if you miss, then you're already at military power and you just take off. It's called a bolter. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so it's. Have you, you know, ever had the bolter? Um, everybody's had the bolter. Uh. <laughs> everybody's had the bolter. Uh, <laughs> our, I think these days we're probably like in the 99 point something percentage in terms of you know, number of junior pilots will bolter more often. Yeah. Um, but every landing, um, we're graded on. So you get a grade from like mm. a one to a four. Um, we're pretty competitive bunch. So that, yeah. you know, the grades are public. Every ready room has your name and your, your call sign and your grades. And at the end of, you know, every hundred landings or so, all the squadrons get together and you give awards to your top 10. Competition is healthy. It's it really is. healthy. Yeah. 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 It's Especially, really healthy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, everything, I try to compete in anything I do yeah. uh, because it just makes me better. Yeah. It's yeah. no doubt. We, and we, you know, it's, <laughs> I think it's, it, it's for all the right reasons, right? Because, you know, that's how you get better and that's how you, you challenge yourself and nothing like some public humiliation to keep you from sure. doing stupid yeah. stuff that yeah. might kill you if you didn't figure it out. Yeah. yeah. So, so a bolter gets you a lesser grade than you'd want. So I, that's why people don't like to bolter because it gives you less than the grade of yeah. what you want is like a, you know, an okay pass, which means you did pretty well. You mentioned call sign earlier. Your call sign is Chopper. Chopper. So when did that happen? Did that happen while you were flying hel helicopters? Or did you, that happen like, oh, this guy's a helicopter yeah. pilot. He's in fly school now. Let's call him Chopper. Which, which, what's yeah. So we, didn't, so we didn't have, at the time, we didn't have call signs in the helicopter community. Mm, you know, and it goes okay. back to, you know, call signs come back from World War II when we didn't encrypt the radios. And if we're flying together, you didn't want me to say, hey, Chad. Yeah. You know, what are you doing? Um, because people were listening and they go, Oh, who's this guy? Where does he gotcha. live? Okay. So that's kind of the origin of the call sign. Then it kind of became cool. Um, that's and cool. so anyways, I didn't, didn't really have now, now it's more common in the helicopter community. But when I got to my first fighter squadron, um, there was, you always show up and there's names on the board. It's always FNG one or two or, you know, or prospect yeah. one or two. <laughs> yeah. from, uh, yeah. and so you, you get a prospect patch for a couple of weeks until you do something that yeah. for me, they're like, we, we never want you to forget where you came from. That's chopper. Cool. You're a chopper pilot. So yeah. That's pretty It all, cool. also, also had to be when like Orange County choppers was popular. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I was yeah. getting all like everyone in the family was getting me chopper gear and t-shirts. Oh, oh cool. that's awesome. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So as far as call signs go, it was pretty good. I could, I could tell my family about that one. If you're watching and wondering uh, what I'm holding here, this beautiful piece of equipment, this is the Smith & Wesson Volunteer. It's one of my favorite uh, firearms from Smith & Wesson. Uh, and uh, I am a proud ambassador of Smith & Wesson firearms. Uh, I have been a lifelong fan of Smith & Wesson. Uh, they are one of the most iconic American companies. I've been around for 170 years making the best firearms, uh, Second Amendment uh, focused. And I uh, love the people there. Um, this from the CEO to the vice president, uh, that, that had become personal friends of mine. They are supporters of our military and first responder communities. In fact, they are supporters of Mighty Oaks, which makes them, uh, the premier sponsor of this show. And, uh, if you are in the market for one of the best firearms out there, then, uh, whether it's a rifle, 
a pistol uh, for whatever reason, for hunting, for self-defense, you, you need to get yourself a Smith & Wesson. Uh, you can't go wrong with Smith & Wesson. The quality, the craftsmanship, and, uh, and, and the company itself is, is no way you go wrong. So check out Smith & Wesson and get yourself one of the most iconic American firearms you get your hands on, Smith & Wesson. Uh, my go-to and a proud supporter of Mighty Oaks and our military and first responder communities. All right, guys, I uh, want to thank one of our show sponsors. By the way, all the sponsors uh, for Resilience are supporters of Mighty Oaks through for our uh, military and first responder communities. Uh, no better one than, than Gators. Gators has been serving the military and first responder communities with the most incredible American-made eyewear for 35 years, uh, lifetime frames. I, I, before I got involved with them professionally, I wore gators all over uh, the world through military operations. The ballistic lenses are something I really believe in, the aluminum frames, the, uh, just the clarity of the lenses, their polarization. I, I, I wore them for skydiving because they, they have a polarized lens that allows you to see digital, uh, digital screens. And so for skydiving, shooting, uh, you name it, all the crazy activities I do, I wore gators, and then now I'm blessed to be in a relationship with them, and they're an amazing partner for Mighty Oaks. The best eyewear out there. Again, lifetime frame, American-made, 35 years of uh, service to our military and first responder communities. There is no better eyewear out there than gators, and they look super cool. So, I love mine, and uh, get yourself some. So, it looks good. Let's shift from the dangers of landing on an aircraft carrier to, to combat. I mean, uh, you, you like, you know, like, like me, I went in 1993, peacetime military, yeah. did a lot of training, a lot of great training, but totally different. You got, you, I remember thinking, I'm training for Vietnam, like, and, and you were training for the Cold War. And, yeah. It's and, the uh, last and, war again, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, the, and then 9-11, a whole world change. I remember I was a sergeant at Third Force Recon Company and I'm um, watching this, those planes flying World Trade Center buildings. I'm like- the world like my life just changed yeah. my life's never going to be the same like not in a bad way i'm like well, let's go do this but I, I knew like i'd just been in a peacetime military at the time for for you know eight nine years right training in special operations and you know everything just changed and uh would, uh, and i'm sure you had a similar experience yeah so you know i, I, mean, I mentioned going through the transition and all my peers uh, being senior i mean if there's one thing that helps your career out when you're behind your peers is is you know 20 years of war combat where you're going to fly a lot. And that's, yeah. uh, so I was actually, I was almost done with the training in the F-18 in Lemoore, California, about to go to my first squadron when 9-11 happened. Mm. I remember I had a strike mission and we were going to actually drop Y bombs from Lemoore and fly all the way to Fallon, which is out east of, uh, east of Reno. That was one of my first live bomb hops. And, uh, we we briefed the flight, came out and saw the news. This is West coast. So things were happening pretty early. We, you know, we're still kind of figuring out what's going on. And then we, got to the point where we briefed the flight ready to go. And then we saw the second one hit. And we're like, we're not going anywhere. Like this just, this really just to your point. Yeah. It, this has changed our lives and we don't even know how yet, but we know that, you know, we're not going to fly today for one. So that's an impact, but we knew that it was going to affect everything. And, um, you know, even back down, like there wasn't, there wasn't a fence around the base. So I think all kinds of things were kind of hastily put and put together. But yeah. I remember thinking, man, this is going to change. Like I, my career transition couldn't have come at a better or worse time as it were. But right. for somebody that wanted to get in the fight, that wanted to fly fighters in combat, um, then, then that was going to have the opportunity and, and then, you know, we're not for nine 11. I don't know how, what it would, how my career would have changed, but certainly I, I felt like it was the right place at the right time to begin that journey. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like almost like the top gun movie, right? Like you're, yeah. you're, you're in school. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's probably what I'm looking at. It. Yeah. It's, it's, you're in school and now the yeah. nation need, the nation needs you like, uh, I mean, um, and then everyone became focused, right? I mean, we saw it, you know, yeah. here domestically around the U.S. We we're all focused on the mission, and certainly the military. We were living that, um, and yeah, there's a new sense of focus on what we we're doing. Like we knew that, yeah. man, all the stuff we trained to, and you come back and you debrief that, like, man, actually, that's gonna we're gonna need that. And so, in, in the nineties, it was always it was always super broad. Like you know, I went, I, I became a recon marine, you know, my first year of my career, so <clears throat> everything was always uh, kind of broadly focused on yeah. being prepared for whatever may happen. Uh, it's just a peacetime military. We, we seem to be more in my job and, and where I was more targeted on North Korea. Like that's kind of like we were training for that, but it was never like, but at that point, at, at that moment, everything became super clear. Yeah. This is. Yeah. And we had experience <clears throat> with desert storm, but that was such a, that seemed like a skirmish and afterthought, right? It sure. Was, 
because it was there was so little, if not you know, same with Somalia, zero, Somalia, yeah. Somalia, there's you a storm. Not, so, not to, not to you know take anyway the thing away from those who participated in that, but no, it, no, it was a it was short lived. Yeah, uh, and we didn't we didn't fundamentally shift our military as a result, right? And how right. we trained, but but certainly nine eleven did, and luckily we had some experience in the area, so we kind of had, had some eyes on it. We had people watching it. And so when Nylon happened, I think that's what allowed us to kind of that and the overwhelming support from, you know, the public at large and, and the world at large. Uh, we were able to focus pretty quickly and, and start, you know, start getting bombs on target within, you know, weeks of 9-11 in Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, I, did, I didn't make it to Afghanistan. On My first squadron was, uh, we went to Iraq. So they had just come back from Afghanistan. I joined them and then we turned around pretty quickly and, and found ourselves uh, deployed over Iraq. So different, different what, beast. What year was that? I was there and start of three. So the start 03. of yeah, yeah. start. So lot, lots of lots of bombings. Uh, yeah. Anti, so anti aircraft weapons system still in all place. All kinds of stuff. Yeah. yeah. We, I was flying. Uh, so I was flying an older lot F 18s so We didn't have GPS and didn't know at the time how that was going to limit us because um, we had we had. You didn't have GPS. We didn't have you, GPS. You use iPhone. I, 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 <laughs> yeah, iPhone. Okay. I should have invested. Um, so so everything we're doing was like dumb bomb dropping. Like and we had you know so we had to. And, and we didn't realize, of course, that that for collateral damage reasons, that everything was going to go GPS or laser guided bombs. Mm -hmm. We could drop sure. laser guided bombs, and we could shoot the gun, and we could drop dumb bombs. Um, but very quickly in Iraq, you know, the tolerance for you know unguided weapons uh, went, to, went to zero. Right, I mean, we see it around the parts of the world right now. But back then, you know, probably a month into the kickoff in OIF, we were like, we're not dropping. No one's dropping dumb bombs anymore because because we're going into urban areas. We've made it so quickly in urban yeah. areas. So then now you're talking GPS. Laser guided, small collateral damage things like the Maverick, um, and yeah. stuff like that. I mean, because immediately you were going, you went from uh, it wasn't like Iraqi military. You, you almost immediately went to insurgents yeah. in, in in Baghdad, right. uh, Ramadi, and Fallujah, like um, amongst the civilian population of right. people who are being victimized. And yeah. yeah, so you can't just and cast, you know, cast for combat or sport. That had been one of those missions like you trained to, but it was always an afterthought until you until OIF kicked off, and we're like, right. man, we better figure out this whole JTAC you know, passing coordinates and figuring that stuff out. So we got good quickly, but yeah, um, that's to say where our, our world's kind of combined is, uh, is the JTAC, uh, yeah. joint, ter joint terminal air controllers or fax yeah. forward air controllers, which would be you guys pilots right. doing a ground duty. And that, I mean, there's a lot of like training in that, but it was, it was, it was really like after my that was the first time that I really seen, uh, I think our, our nation really seen that imp implemented that way in real yeah. life in, in real time. Like a, a lot of training, a lot of thought. It was a lot of good yeah. forward thinking towards tactical, but now we have a Iraq, Afghanistan is where you got to actually see it come in. Yeah. And we were play. in the urban area too. So like it just, we had to get really good at it. I mean, our, our last time doing JTACs and stuff, you go back to Vietnam, it was, it was a, we could accept higher collateral because we were talking open jungle areas. Yeah, exactly. It's but when much you're, different. When you're in urban areas, man, you know, you, we had to figure that out and we had to be good at it quickly. And so it was that, I mean, JTACs were learning as we were learning at the same time and kind yeah. of understanding that. And, and it got, you know, as we all, as GPS progressed, as you know, cause we obviously went back to Iraq several times as everyone started getting GPS and these higher precision weapons, then, then it made it a little bit easier. I mean, now, now you have ways you can, yeah. you, you can drop things like on this table if you wanted, probably from, yeah. from high up. But, yeah. um, but back then we were figuring it out, which, um, and you know, it was never lost to me. We had guys on the ground cause you'd, you'd hear them talking to you and then yeah, you, hear yeah. the, you hear the zinging over their heads yeah. and you're like, mm. yeah, I don't know what, when, oh no. I mean, my day, like, you know, 113 UHF radio talking right yeah. directly to pilot. The, yeah. uh, for those listening, like, um, when you, you know, you may wonder like how, how does a, a aviator get bombs on target? You know, sometimes they're, you guys are just by sight or, or by, yeah. by predestined target, but a lot of times guys on the ground, if you have like an infantry unit, a big infantry unit or something like that, or then they'll usually have a forward air controller, which is a pilot trained to be a ground duty. And he's talking to the pilot, calling bombs in. In my world, in special operations world, we'll take one of our special operators, send them to the JTAC school. Yeah. And then we get certified to be able to call in close air support uh, and do fire control missions. My son, uh, Hunter did have the tour in Afghanistan. And he was an Anglico Marine, Air, uh, Air Naval Gunfire Liaison Company. And that's basically the forward air control yeah. element that the Marine Corps gives to foreign nationals. Uh, and, he, and that way they could have access to air support. And he was a... Uh, he he was better with the Jargons infantry yeah. unit in, in Afghanistan. and got to call live fire, fire missions in. Yeah, because from thirty thousand feet, it's really hard to distinguish a target. <laughs> so yeah. the start of the campaign, when we're, we're targeting bridges or bunkers and airfields, okay, I can I don't need a JTAC potentially for that. Sure, but that that was short lived, and we quickly got both in Iraq and Afghanistan where I needed somebody JTAC on the ground to say, hey, here's the target, or here, 
a target you think is a target. It's no longer a target. Or, right. hey, we got friendlies in there. Like, yeah. you know, when you took off two hours ago, we didn't, but now we do. So let's yeah. just tell you where you want to draw. So that coordination was, was, you know, essential, you know, and obviously, you know, people talk about drones and everything now, but having folks on the ground, I mean, you'll never probably replace that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, a con the human conscience, right? To to yeah. be on the ground, you you you're, you got a either a high value target or a target of opportunity on the ground, or you know, you know, somebody's moving a weapons cache or something like that, and you're in the ground and and you're about to call in, you know, yeah. an aircraft on the on that target, but now you have children and, sure. and right there. I mean, a drone's not going to decipher those things. Yeah, and a truck <laughs> looks like a truck from thirty thousand feet, but yeah. one truck might actually you know have guys in the back with guns, and mine one might just have guys with you know, supplies and food and they're just going somewhere else. So yeah. Yeah. It's pretty yeah. important. And people are stupid. Like, uh, like the, the people like in combat, like you think people would be like hiding yeah. or they're, they're like, they're like driving up to checkpoints. Like, ah, I like yelling at people. Yeah. <laughs> Stacks of pipes in the back. Yeah. You're like, you know what that looks like from. Yeah. Yeah. From yeah. Right yeah. So just bringing a human element to it. Yeah. 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 My hat's off to the guys who are like yourself that were down there. Yeah. Cause I was going back to the ship. I just had to land at night on the ship, but, but I was going to get probably a burger and fries on the ship. And, mm. yeah. But you know, we, we never lost sight of the fact that we wouldn't be able to do anything we did without guys on the ground. What, what about the anti-aircraft? Uh, like the, the, yeah, the SAM threat. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, this, the surface, yeah, the same surface, same missiles. I mean, I mean, even Iraq, they had like the ZSU 23 type thirties and yeah. stuff like that. that you guys like old, yeah, I, old, old, old uh, Soviet stuff. Yeah. They had like the SA twos and SA threes yeah. and uh, some SA sixes and stuff that were, were certainly capable. I mean, they were more capable 20 years prior sure. kind of the, but was that ever, Walmart. have you, did you guys feel like that was a threat or you were like, now we're, think, we're superior. No, we were that. always paying attention. I mean, yeah. I remember, I remember, you know, the triple A fire, um, I didn't, I mean, you'd see it, but it was, it was pretty unguided. Like they weren't trying to really focus in and cause they knew that as soon as we found out where they were, we were going to smack them. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and we had the ability to do that pretty quickly. So, so our thoughts were like in the start of the campaign, you know, we were, we were told that, you know, Saddam had said, Hey, you, you will shoot it, you know, until you're out of weapons or out of missiles. And so, but they knew that by shooting, we'd probably kill them. Right. We'd probably retaliate immediately because we have guys watching for that stuff. Um, so my sense is they were often just firing so they could at least get a participation trophy for mm -hmm. firing, yeah. but not necessarily guiding them. So I think the couple of times where I saw a SAM missile, it, it gets your adrenaline going a little bit. Because sure. you're seeing it coming up and it's the size of a telephone pole and it's moving pretty fast, but then you quickly realize it's just going like it's, you know, like a ro model rocket kit. It's just going to go mm -hmm. above you and then you kind of keep an eye on it. So, so I mean, yeah, it, it, we certainly paid attention to it and we operated in a way to minimize the threat. Um, but very quickly we realized that it was just guys pulling the trigger and then probably jumping in their car and getting them out of there because we were going to turn around and, and drop something right on that site, you know, yeah. within, within minutes. So, but that way maybe they avoided getting executed by the regime at the time. Yeah, but before we move into your commander stuff, I, I just want to ask, like, you know, every every warrior has like a kind of like a couple of handful of moments in combat that stick out. Uh, you know, that campfire war yeah. story. Are there any are there any one you want to that you feel comfortable sharing, like a, a campfire kind of war story of of your yeah. an operation, a mission? Um there's a couple. I think, you know, the, I think one I wrote in the book because I think it's it's a good story for many reasons, but um, you know, we were we were, I think we were towards Missoula or something, Iraq. And we were, uh, uh, these were guys who were pinned down under fire. And so we had a call for support and we, we went in there. We, we, we basically diverted from the tanker. We had a section. So two, two F-18s and we had, we were carrying GPS weapons and laser guided weapons. Uh, and we had the gun and I remember, you know, they were talking to us and part of the problem was they were getting shot at across like this, think of a city square and people where they were kind of pinned down. They were trying to I think they were trying to go east towards Syria, the, the U.S. forces. Um, I think they were Marines. And then, but they didn't know how to, talk, like they couldn't, to your point, like there was the whole city square was full of people protesting what was going on. And so obviously the insurgents were using that to their advantage. So they were, yeah. hey, no one's going to drop a bomb on us now because we're surrounded by thousands of civilians that are protesting water and power and all the stuff that was going on back then. But the Marines had to get out of there I and mean, they couldn't get out of there safely. Um, so I remember thinking, man, this is going to be a hard, this is going to be a hard one to figure out. Like, I just don't want to drop a bomb, you know, unless, unless they're no kid about to be overrun, that'd be maybe different. Um, but I know there'd be collateral damage. Like I just, there's no way you can drop a 500 pound bomb with people around it. I'd kill more than you intend to. And so we were looking at it. And, and so we, we basically came to the conclusion with the JTAC. Well, how about we start with a show of force? Like give me a very low, fast flyby with and spit flares out. Um, and I remember going, 
we had some rules on how low we were supposed to go at the time, but it still seemed like a better option than me, you know, me going below 10,000 feet, which is our hard deck at the time, to do this than drop a bomb and kill a bunch of civilians. Um, and, and of course, flying low and fast sounded pretty fun too. Mm -hmm. It was a good way. Yeah. So I remember, but I remember doing it going, all right. And I had another pilot with me. So we kind of set up to do, um, you know, kind of off axis and similar timelines, almost like an air show thing. Um, yeah. But I remember going, hey, I'm doing this not because it's, you know, I'm doing this for an air show. I'm doing this because this is the only thing that's going to work. If I can get these people to get out of there, it allows the Marines to return fire and maybe, it'll, you know, get the insurgents to stop what they're doing and escape. And so I was kind of going through like, all right, remember, this isn't an air show. You're doing this, you know, and I got pretty low, pretty fast. And I was spitting out flares, which, you know, which don't harm anybody below you, but it gets people attention. And so we did that. And, and I remember, remember just like, just, I still remember today, just cruising through this town square with buildings up above you. I don't know how low I was, probably pretty darn low. Mm -hmm. I remember trying not to hit anything and figure I was like, going. You mean like under 100 feet low? Probably. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Um, pretty low. How fast? Like pretty fast, probably <laughs> 550 or so. Yeah. I mean, I was I was hauling. Yeah. Um, and um, just the sound is intimidating. And like, yeah. And it's, I mean, if you've ever been in an air show where like the, you yeah. know, the sneak pass from the Blue yeah. Angels, I mean, it terrifies you, but you almost mm -hmm. know it's coming. Uh, we were probably lower and faster uh, than, than they were. And, and, but it had it had exactly the effect I wanted. So, but I have that image of flying over and just looking at people, and it happens quick, right? But wow. it's, sure. time kind of slows down. So, yeah. Um, so I remember that one because it was a great alternative way to solve the problem. Um, yeah. The easier solution was the hammer and the toolbox, which is to take out a building and then it, you know, and the collateral damage that might come with that. I mean, that's true. That's the easiest because it's the biggest yeah. tool you have in your toolbox. Right. But I was impressed by the Marines and the and the coordination. Basically, say, hey, why don't we? Let me try something different first before we get to that level of, right. of you know, that, that big hammer, as it were. So we yeah. use a small hammer. Uh, that's what makes Americans good guys, you know? Yeah. Uh, and that's what, what always separates us. And, you know, people always, you know, people sometimes like, you know, criticize, you know, American force or something like that. But I've always seen us, even in, the, in spite of us being like treated like hor horribly by, by the yeah. enemy combat and 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 most of the time we're fighting we're always we're fighting in their backyard and they're putting their civilians in danger and, and, and intentionally hiding behind their civilians and then we always end up you know taking the, the high yeah. ground that's what makes that's what makes us the good guys usually in my opinion that just yeah. small pra practical level and I, and I think i think war right war war tries to take away your humanity mm -hmm. um but i think in the in the U.S. forces, at least, we do a good job of understand. We, we understand the independence. We understand we all come from similar backgrounds. Um, we're fighting for a common cause, and it, and allows us never to lose that humanity. And that's maybe that example there. Yeah, I mean, there's probably forces out there from other nations who would have said, "Well, too bad, right? We're going to just take out the building, and so be it." You know, if there's another hundred casualties, but I think you know, America does a good job of making sure we don't lose sight of humanity yeah. of why we're you know. Yeah. We we don't get wrong. We like to fight. We like to yeah, we yeah. train for combat, but we don't do it to like go kill people. We do it because we, we believe what we're doing for the right reasons. And if there's a way to do it, we'll do it. If we're called upon, we'll break out the big hammer because we have, you know, if we have to, but we yeah. never lose, we, we try not to lose our humanity. It's it's one of the things I've noticed in, you know, 20 years of war and eight deployments of myself. And one of the things I've always noticed and, 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 and it's made me really reflect on, you know, since World War One, the America goes and does the hard thing that we have to do yeah. to protect our national interest and to protect uh, people that can't defend themselves around the world. But then we, we've always given these countries back and rebuild yeah. them. And I, mean, uh, I, I, mean, we, we I spent so many could. years in Japan and there's a great example of a country yeah. that we were at odds were like, it was an existential threat mm -hmm. on both sides that mm -hmm. we dropped nuclear weapons on. But as soon as the campaign, as soon as the war was over, as soon as they, you know, total, you know, capitulation and they gave, you know, then we said, all right, now we're going to help you rebuild. Yeah. And look at how strong Japan is now. And look at what a strong ally they are. And uh, by, by the way, we would have had with all rights to put an American flag up and claim that. Yeah. And other <laughs> countries would have. And, yeah. You know, we we were so strategic about it, right? Mm -hmm. We left the emperor in place and, and you know, and then there's some great decisions were made back then. And, yeah. and and I just, I was in Japan last week, actually. And every time I travel around there, I mean, just there's incredible respect for one another. We're mm -hmm. incredible allies. And it's a thriving economy right oh, yeah. they they, they yeah. do amazing things and and uh, so one I, of my face, favorite places to travel the people are so kind and easy to and, get around uh, very clean and yeah. yeah yeah a lot of respect yeah. so so i you know i like that as the ideal like you know i think some cases we always think that's what's going to happen um you know maybe that's our fallacy from a foreign policy mm -hmm. standpoint as we go man look at japan why isn't iraq afghanistan like japan mm -hmm. and now it's now you know this isn't a foreign policy show but i mean obviously you know it worked in Japan for various reasons and the mm -hmm. culture there mattered. It's mm -hmm. a country, culture fundamentally based on family and tradition. Mm -hmm. um, you don't get that same in other parts of the world. So 
uh, it's much harder, I think, to think, you know, if we think that we're going to go in, you know, mm. yeah, win, so to speak, sign the peace treaty, and the next thing you know, it's like Tokyo. Yeah. That's not likely to happen, but but that's what we want. That still mm -hmm. remains our ideal, yeah. and we don't approach any conflict without that goal of being yeah. just a future ally and a partner, not as a dominator, not as an invader. We don't want that. That costs yeah. money and time. We want to be a future ally and a partner, and we approach, I think, everything yeah. as we have in Iraq, Afghanistan. That was truly our intent going in. Yeah, yeah. It, it, they lacked, uh, in my you know opinion, they they lacked the winning strategy in the end. Yeah, and which which is what the one of the main factors is why we, yeah, what you know. And it ended the way it did. So the deployments happen. You go from being a you know a, a fighter, uh, you know aviator to uh, taking. What was your first time? You know, leaving that. I, I guess as, as aviator, you're always you're always even even when you become a commander, you're still yeah, a fighter, you right? I mean, yeah, you still get to fly. In fact, you yeah. probably you can fly as much as you want. I I did a couple back to back squadron tours after nine eleven. Uh, all in Iraq and, and then, uh, I had command of a squadron. So I was a commanding officer of a squadron, um, out of Lemoore. I spent all my time in central California and it was after that. So after almost 10 years in the cockpit, which again, I, I didn't predict that when I did the transition, right, but, right. but that's not a bad way to spend 10 years when you're no. back to back squadrons as a instructor or as a, you know, as a, as a war fighter, as we say, and then led to command of a squadron where you're in charge of a squadron with, you know, I think we had 12 airplanes and 250 people. Um, and that's for, when that squadron command tour was over, then I, then I pivoted and not pivoted. Then I had to do my payback like staff tour, which everyone has to do as sure. a senior. So, um, and then one of my biggest successes, I never had to serve at the Pentagon. Uh, I've been at the Pentagon many times, but yeah. I was able to do things like say, you know what? I won't go to the Pentagon, but I'll go overseas. Where do you want me to go? And they sent me and my family to Italy. Yeah. So I did a couple of years in Italy and the staff there. Um, and actually that got very wrapped up in, in Libya and whatnot. So that was unexpected. But yeah. You go to Pentagon like 05 and you're like a really like an E2. Yeah. You're like, you're like making coffee and you're waxing <laughs> yeah. the floors and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, I, yeah. So the whole family moved out to Italy, which was an awesome experience for the family and, and enjoyed that. And then as a staff job, um, that was a NATO staff, which is kind of interesting. Heavily like it was a staff of 110 and, and half the staff was U.S. And, um, and Brits. And then the rest were pieces of the other NATO countries. Normally a sleepy holiday job. Normally it's like. You plan out your weekends on, you know, what major capital you want to go to. You're going to go see the pyramids. Yeah. Uh, it was, you know, it was a payback tour to my wife. Was, you know, for all the time we spent more, we didn't travel as much. Um, and so we, yeah, so it was, then Libya happened. And so then it became like the staff. It was actually a pretty good staff job because it went from a sleepy hollow job where I was just worried about coffee and what yeah. we were on the weekends to uh, suddenly we're, we're putting together target packs and we're looking at Libya from, you know, all the way from Tripoli to Benghazi and heavily involved in that for about 10 months. Um, as a staff person goes, that's about the best staff job you can have. Cause I was, you know, you were literally picking targets, talking to folks, you weren't fighting, right? You, you know, by, by the nature of the job, you're not actually in a cockpit or you're not boots on deck, but, um, but you were very involved in what's going on. And we were all these ad hoc Intel services. I mean, we were talking to folks that had people on the ground with cell phones. It was this hodgepodge kind of let's get everything together. Um, Sadly, of course, we went into that thinking that, you know, it was going to be like Japan. Eventually, we and we used to joke on the staff, like, eventually, we're going to be able to go back and, and take a family vacation to, you know, Benghazi or Tripoli. And, yeah. you know, for those paying attention right now, it's still not a place you want to go back to. No, I mean, uh, yeah. And it might never yeah. be. But no. but we spent uh, eight months, so 10 months focused on living. Gaddafi was this is killed, killed when you were around the yeah. time. Yeah. So, um, and then yeah. Uh, and I, in fact, um, I was... I remember the, I had a guy that worked for me from another foreign country. He came to me. We were in the on the campus, as we call it there in, in Naples. And he's like, Chapa, Chapa, let me show you this picture. And he pulls out his cell phone. And he's like, we got him. I'm like, have you wow. shown anybody else that? And he goes, no, oh, who should we show? I'm like, well, let's go show the general. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was a, such an ad hoc. That's a foreign leader. Let's execute it. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they, I think they're drug in the lot. street. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the whole thing was interesting because there was. Uh, you know, say what you want about Intel and this bureaucracy. Yeah. There was none of that. This was like a pickup game like you read about. And and it was just yeah. about relationships. It was about both, you know, within the U.S. contract, but also all these folks that, you know, that we had befriended and I could reach out to that were actually, you know, were boots on deck in, yeah. in Libya that that weren't, you know, bound by the same rules we had as the U.S. So yeah. um, I learned, I thought a lot about what special forces guys do when you're trying to build those networks and stuff. And that's yeah. kind of what worked for us is we had the right people 
and you know, I'd buy them coffee at the right time, and and then they were willing to share pretty good intel when I needed it. And yeah, the human human network is, is so important. Yeah. You, you have local national relationships, you just don't do anything without it. In this yeah, place. So, we, yeah. You you sh- you know, they always say it's you know it's hard to fight with your allies, right? It's hard because of comms and language barriers, but it's much harder to fight without them. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's, and that's why I think we do what we do, and why we try to train as much as we do with our allies, because wherever yeah. we go, it's we are going to need somebody's help. Were you part of, uh, you know, as I mean, guys, we had Mark Geis on here, Oz, you know, was okay, part yeah. of 13 hours. Yeah. He, was, he was on the show. He's become a, a friend of ours. And, uh, and, um, uh, I mean, man, like without getting really into it, like if they could have got a flyby, if they could have got that same flyby, yeah. that, 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 sh- that, that show of force that, that you were able to give in Baghdad, like if they were able to get that over that annex. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I wasn't involved in the planning for that or, or, or non planning. Um, yeah, that was a challenge. I mean, logistically it was a tough it was going to be a tough nut to correct no matter what you do, but um, you'd like to think there would have been things like that considered. Like, mm-hmm. okay, we can't maybe get a helicopter. Or we have nothing to get there to, to mm-hmm. and right away, right away. But right. can we get something to do a flyby? Can we just drop some ordnance in the vicinity to show we we were there? And uh, yeah, I think we, we clearly underestimated what was going on. Not only yeah. the the occasion and why it happened, which was is a failure, but also then our reaction to it. Uh, and yeah. I think people kind of got. I think people sat on their hands thinking it was good, a problem would go away. And, and as we know in this yeah. business, there's no, no problem goes away on its own. You no. know? And, and you'd much rather be proactive and solve yeah. the problem on your terms and just kind of yeah. wait and hope, which is a horrible strategy. It was a tender box. Yeah. I have heard the argument of, of, you know, the argument on, on one side is, oh, if we would have sent, you know, a flyby, you know, by the time they'd have got there, it'd have been over. But but then that's also trying to say that now you know when when this is going to be over and how bad it is to begin yeah. with. So yeah. I think what you said is exactly right. Is is kind of like no action was taken when some some level of action should yeah. have been taken, with especially with you know allies and U.S. forces there. Yeah, as an American, I would have felt better knowing that okay, it ended as it did. Maybe we couldn't change that, but but we had all kinds of assets rolling action. in, and we yeah, had yeah. fighters inbound. And we oh, there's assets all over the place, right? And then yeah, yeah and the real question is, you know, what did we have? And and yeah. Argu- you know, argument would be that we just didn't prioritize correctly because we yeah. didn't anticipate how it was going to go down. Uh, and like you know, we said, we're, we're all war fighters, so yeah. we don't sit back and watch a problem happen. You yeah. know, get no. me in the game. I don't care what the yeah. odds are. Get me in the game. Yeah. 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 I, can, I, I know some of the guys from Delta Force that were there and they were just like, you know, and then I knew a Q, uh, Marine QRF that was uh, like, I know guys that were, that were part of that and they were just like, yeah, they were just chopping the bit like let's go let's go what are we doing why are we waiting and they were just stood down stood down and yeah so yeah it was it was a it was a you know obviously a terrible thing but uh with you you know moving to commander role i, I think one of the things we really want to get and you talk a lot about it and uh, and, and surf where, surf where you can uh is about being the commander of the nuclear aircraft carrier uh five thousand men 25 billion dollars in, in, uh, in, in, you know, of, of resources and manpower, like all, all these things you're responsible for. What's that like to go? You, so you go on from being an aviator, uh, a squadron commander to that, like, how do you get there? I mean, yeah, you gotta learn how to, you gotta learn. You, you t- we talked earlier about it, but just the process of training to get there. Yeah. So I left that Italy staff job and that's where I got picked up for the, the aviation carrier pipeline, as we call it. So the aircraft carrier pipeline, it's a 10 year pipeline. And it's, and basically it's going to be two years in nuclear power school, two years as an XO, two years in your deep draft ship, and then two to three years as your aircraft carrier command tour. So it's a 10 year thing. So, wow. um, again, I remember asking, you, you have to commit to that. Like, is it, you don't, but that's, that's just how it's going to lay out. That's and, the path. And, yeah. and really it's interesting because for the first time in your career, you're like, man, I actually kind of know what I'm going to do for 10 years, which is, as we know, it's yeah. rare. Yeah. Um, obviously I went to, like I did for the fighter transition, I went to my wife and said, what do you think? And. You know, she's, she's all in. She's been a great supporter. So before you go on, but why, why though? I mean, I'm, like you're have a successful career at this point. You're, yeah. You've done some really, really crazy, um, successful oh, not things. Not why I asked my wife, but why. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> yeah. no, not why I asked your wife. Because well, you, you had a fork in the road, right? We I always, mean, yeah. always hit a fork yeah. in the road in the military career. Yeah. yeah. Here, here, we're all going to ask our wife, like you said earlier, but, but yeah, I mean, you're successful. I'm, like, I haven't like, been yeah. You know, what's the, um, <laughs> share some of your mindset around, you know, well, I saw, I definitely saw it as a challenge, right? I remember being a junior pilot on a flight deck and aircraft carrier and looking at the captain going, man, like, how do you get there? Like, who is this guy? Yeah. And he's like the king and stuff. And, and it wasn't because I wanted the power or prestige it's because I was just fascinated by how you, how do you possibly get to that point where you yeah. can do that? Um, it's funny because then when you're there in the position, you're like, man, I hope people don't look at me the same way. Cause I feel like I'm still a yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. 24 year old fighter pilot. Um, 
and so it was the challenge, the one like, you know, Hey, I don't, you know, I certainly would be content to keep flying. Although I knew I wouldn't fly as much as I could potentially as aircraft carriers. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was the challenge. It was a chance to, I mean, I liked, I liked what I, I liked being not only flying, but I liked the people I was working with. I liked being in charge, so to speak. Like I felt comfortable in my squadron tour, you know? And I always said, you know, I joined the Navy to, to fly. That's it. I mean, you know, I was that young kid in Nellis Air Force Base, or I was the kid watching Top Gun when I was 16. Um, I joined to fly, but yeah. I didn't stay for that reason. I stayed for the people. Um, so the perfect combination was that I got to work with people. I got to maybe, you know, work alongside and lead if I was lucky enough, but also fly. So I saw it was kind of a combination of that is here's a chance to challenge myself, which I think is important for personal <laughs> growth. Um, I, I thought it was a heck of an opportunity to to go on and learn about leadership in a different you know a different entity and also get to work with people in a larger entity which means you can be you can have more of an influence um and yeah. and yeah and, and it kind of worked out that way i guess because like i still uh, remember being on the bridge of the ship like drinking my coffee and people are watching me i'm like again i feel like you're that young kid i don't know how i got here but but it was the idea that it, you know if i got to where i wanted you know where i saw the end goal i had a pretty clear vision of that that i thought i could i think i could make a positive difference for one yeah. um I knew it'd be fun to do along the way. I think it's a, for something that goes 600 knots to something that goes 20 knots. Yeah. Is that, it's, <laughs> uh, it's what you're talking about is it, we talk about this at resilient a lot. This is what resilient is built, built off of, you know, yeah. especially driving into the four pillars, mind, body, spirit, and social is you, we live in this world of con constant convenience. We have everything at our fingertips here and people don't challenge themselves. They don't really build a resilient life and you have to challenge yourself if you actually want to grow. I mean, yeah. you, you literally like challenge equals progress. And I love I mean, you're a pilot, so I love this, like, you know, uh, uh, aircraft needs that opposing force to actually be able to rise and take off and, and yeah. you know, fly. And so I think it's super amazing to hear. And I, I, I think this is something that needs to be shared is that we need to challenge ourselves, not only as men, as a society, especially as men, but as a society, we have to challenge ourselves. There's a specific, you know, part of your brain that actually only grows if you intentionally do something hard yeah. and you know that before you do it, it's going to be hard and you do it anyways. Yeah. Well, I it, think it's one of the things I keep hearing Brett say that, I mean, is one, um, the challenge you challenge yourself his whole life and his career to get to where, you know, be the commander of, of, of a, you know, nuclear powered air, aircraft carrier. But, but one of the things you said that it really resonates to me is there's been a lot of intentionality. Yeah. Like, uh, and as we talk about these, you know, four pillars, yeah. mind, body, spirit, social, one of the things we always teach when we're speaking, Public doing when we're doing our public speaking, speaking to our troops, and in and, and helping guys in our recovery programs, it's, it's always about being intentional about you know mentally being as you know have the right mindset, having the yeah. right uh, uh, you know, attitude, physically taking care of your health, your body, uh, uh, spiritually having a strong spiritual foundation. You know, for for Sean and I, and most of you know, and the people that work at Mighty Oaks, we're, we're all Christians, and we've been at that pillar of being you know, through a relationship with Christ and. And then, uh, and then socially, like you even said earlier, you can't pick who you work with, but you could, you could pick who you let speak in and influence to yeah. your life. And, uh, and it's just, those things require such intentionality. And, I, and I, I'm hearing you just explain your career and how you got to where you were. And it sounds like there was just so much intentionality yeah. uh, through that. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, you look at those four pillars. I mean, every time I try to find these challenges, it was, I mean, it could be a, a physical challenge, but it was also the, it was the mind challenge, right? It was the idea that you're, you're challenging yourself, you're going to grow. I mean, I think about every time I travel to a foreign country. Right. Think about how your senses are heightened because you're somewhere new and you're learning the culture and you're, you know, versus where you just go to the mall, you know, down the street and you kind of, kind of do it half assed. Um, so I found that, you know, I, I thrive on that. I mean, I really like when I find ways to challenge myself because one, I, it heightens your senses and you, and you realize, you know, you're just, you feel sharper for it. It's like, it's almost like a drug. Yeah. Um, but you also grow from it to your point. It's kind of like working out. Like if you, just put the bar on there and you don't put any more weight, well, you're, you're not really going to challenge yourself. Yeah. But if you, if you're always trying to get your best PR, well, guess what? You're going to grow from that. It's going to hurt. You're going to be sore the next day, but that's how you grow. That's how you get stronger. Um, so for me, you know, I kind of looked at the career the same way as how do I challenge myself? Because I think if you, and there's things you have to do to be successful. I mean, it's not just about, yeah, sign, raising your hand and signing yeah, up sure. for it. Yeah. You've got to have those pillars in the bank, right? You've got to have a strong family network. Uh, I've known many people that struggled the same career path because their family fell apart. Um, I know many people that physically fell apart because they weren't taking care of themselves. And when you challenge yourself, so if you, if you're willing to, if you spend the time to invest in those pillars, um, like, you know, we were talking about earlier, it's like an investment. If you spend the time on family, social spirit and mind, then when, then you can pursue these paths and you're going to have the resources you need to do it. Yeah. Um, so it was never lost on me that none of these paths I could have done without having a strong family network. Right. Yeah. And that, you know, that meant my wife and kids and extended family. 
Shout Isn't, out, shout out to your wife and kids, by the way. It takes a strong woman to to support that. Yeah, so yeah, I mean Best uh, decision I ever made. And shout out to I don't know if you want to share her name, but shout out to your wife. She's it's so, Mary. So. And she and she has a company and she hires veterans and, and uh, military oh, spouses awesome. now. So yeah. what what company so, is it? It's called say? Client Cloud Care. So Client they Cloud. um she started about two years ago and and they're they're just growing exponentially. Hires veterans, uh military spouses. It's all remote part-time work and they do CRM database management. Oh, wow. So really interesting. Um, they support a lot of nonprofits. And That's then, those guys, they're, they're CRM supports nonprofits. Yeah. 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 And then, then yeah. and they're expanding beyond just nonprofits, but that's a whole nother journey. Cause yeah. you know, I watch her from, you know, as we raise three kids and I'm always off goofing off and, <laughs> and you know, playing fighter pilot yeah, yeah. and yeah. to watch her keep everything kind of moving along line and keeping the boys sane and, and, and doing yeah. well. And then, and then. Yeah. She chooses to start a company because she saw a need, and yeah. next thing you know, she's. I mean, I, offline we we got to we got to yeah, we can check it out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. they're always we'll looking for, it out. Yeah. for growth, and and I like it because it does. It's that payback to, to spouses yeah. and, and all over yeah. the country, all over the world, really. That are yeah. that are out there. Um. So yeah, so you you have to put time in, right? You know, the, the idea of resiliency is you just can't call upon it when you need it. You can't just suddenly go to the bank because you win the lottery. To me, it's always a long term investment. And and that's what allowed me, I think, to pursue this, these paths because I knew that I'd put the time in on those things. That, that so when you know when, when things happen, or I wanted to challenge myself, or I had to say, you know what, kids, we're moving. Sorry, we didn't know about this. We're moving next week. We're going to go to South Carolina or, yeah. or wherever. They were all in. They were always excited about it. Um, yeah. So I think you know, investing time behind the scenes as it were allowed me to be very intentional about my career path. Yeah. And then gave me the support I needed um, that I knew otherwise it wouldn't have been. And in the, the day, you know, I always say, you know, one of your, your biggest awards is not the letter from the president or the medals you get is the fact that, you know, if you're lucky enough, you've got your family with you, you got your health and you can hold your head high because you've enjoyed what you did for that 20, 30 years or, or two years, whatever it is. And I feel very blessed because I, you know, I always say the, probably the single best decision you can make, um, is, is who your spouse is going to be. Mm, yeah. And I, I chose wisely. Yeah. Well, uh, there's always these moments I look back in my life that, uh, there's these surreal moments and uh and uh, and i think like just certain certain moments in those transitions for me and i'm i'm hearing you talk and, I, and i'm just kind of curious for you like you go through all the, you, you have your career as an aviator you're a commander of a squadron you go through nuclear power school you you become an exo and now there's got to be a moment where you step on an aircraft carrier as the commander of that carrier and you realize like you you have to there has to be a moment where time time stands still as you pause and reflect like yeah. I'm I'm responsible for this carrier, uh, all these aircraft on it, yeah. all these uh, five thousand sailors, twenty five billion dollars in equipment. Like I'm responsible. For all that. What was, do you do? You remember that moment and what it was like? Just walking on there. I mean, Navy's very ceremonial, right? Yeah. So, like when you do the ceremony, it's like you come on as they they ring the bells and you're captain, United States Navy, and then then you do the ceremony, the change of command in front of you know hundreds of people, and then when you leave the stage, you're now you're no longer captain. You're now the Roosevelt. You assume the identity of the ship. Mm -hmm. okay. So anytime you Come or go from the ship. They always say Theodore Roosevelt arriving or whatever the ship name so is. So you're, you're you're the Roosevelt now. So you become the Roosevelt, which is yeah. a daunting in itself. Yeah, right? sure. um, and so I, I, so that I think I was well prepared for. I think the moment that strikes me is when we were first underway at sea with all the airplanes and people. And, yeah, and we're on the bridge of the ship and we're out. We left the channel and and then sitting there with a cup of coffee. And then everyone looks I looks at me. Picture, and, I picture it. You sit there. Yeah, you're sitting there and and, uh, <laughs> and everyone looks at me and goes, "All right, Captain, where are we going?" I'm like, oh, "Like I said, it's my oh, yes, my." <laughs> <laughs> Guys, if you don't have precious metals, uh, you got to get your hands on some. Uh, the world is not a stable place. Our banking system certainly is not a, a stable place. So it's important to have precious gold and silver on hand. Uh, for me, precious gold, precious silver, and uh, and also precious lead uh, to be able to protect yourself. But look, if you uh, are not already into this, you need to go to MidasGoldGroup.com. Uh, our friends there are incredible People, they're incredible patriots. Uh, they love America and they have the best uh, resources on precious metals. Uh, the owner, James Clark, is a Marine Corps veteran. Uh, he's a patriot and he is uh, my friend also. And they're just incredible people who know this market inside and out. And you could go there. And if you mention my name, Chad Roby Show, you will get free silver. You'll get some free silver and uh, you can invest in precious metals and have tangible precious metals on hand. Uh, in a time of need, uh, when the when those financial markets go down, go to myschoolgroup.com and get your precious metals today. Guys, uh, you heard me say before, 
You will never hear people promote something that I don't use and don't believe in. One of the supporters of this show is, is BioPro. Uh, I am a believer in this product. It offers you a complete growth factor profile. I mean, you're talking about improving your sleep, uh, growing muscle, releasing your own uh, growth hormones in your body, improving your metabolism, just bone density, uh, the, the way you feel, your overall mood, your sexual desire, your libido, all these just incredible things that uh, that or come naturally if you could trigger it from your body. As Bio Pro does that for you. I, there's a lot of benefits I, I've, I've heard of from other pro athletes that take this uh, from special operators. But for me personally, uh, uh, I, I've, I've definitely noticed the increase in recovery. But the biggest thing I've noticed for me is my sleep. Uh, sleep's important to me. Uh, I function well with all the stuff I have to do, from speaking, from writing, to do, running Mighty Oaks, to uh, doing podcasts like this and and uh, and going on international operations. Like I have to have good sleep in order to be able to function at my highest level. And I was not getting it. I would sleep like four or five hours a night. It was it was kind of choppy. And I was doing all kinds of things for years. And as soon as I started taking BioPro, uh, I started getting eight to nine hours of solid sleep. That's why I'm just hammering home how much I love this product. Uh, the people there are absolutely amazing. They're supporters of our military and first responders. They support Mighty Oaks. Uh, and the product is absolutely incredible. You have to try it. Uh, go to BioPro. And if you enter the code BioPro30, you'll get 30% off. That's not my code. Uh, I actually don't want a code. I want you to get 30% off. And uh, so enter BioPro30 and you get 30% off. Uh, get yours today. Brett, I want to talk about something that that I love about your book. And again, we, we can highlight it more later, but but for, for the viewers listening, Surf When You Can is a sleeper leadership book. I mean, it has leadership in the title, but but it's got some phenomenal leadership principles. And I love leadership. You know, I, I, I like, um, I study leadership principles. I've seen a lot of poor leaders in my life, so it's made me want to be a good leader, um, even outside of, you know, actually what most people consider positions of leadership, even in being a good leader in, in my role as a husband, as a father. But you talk a lot about some things, so I'd, I'd love for you to share for the audience, and this is broad, uh, so forgive me, but just your leadership principle, and, and I, I've, you know, you really take the, the mindset of a servant leader and the way that you really look out for your sailors or whatever position you're in, you really, you really, aren't there to be a dictator. You're there to serve the people. Just share some yeah. of your ideas around leadership. Yeah. I mean, I think obviously leadership evolves over time. I mean, no one's, and maybe people are, have, are better leaders naturally than others, but I think that really it's still a learned thing. It's something mm -hmm. that you develop over time. And, um, and it goes probably back to when you were, you were a kid. I mean, I remember at home watching my parents and there were some integral things they taught me about leadership. And, you know, I remember my dad, you know, his company was in hard time. So he was bringing some of the work home that otherwise it could have, you know, that otherwise someone had to follow somebody else. And it could have been as simple as like rolling the quarters, you know, from the Coke machines. And I'm yeah. like, and my dad was a business executive. I'm like, well, why are you doing that? He goes, well, somebody has got to do it. And, and we all got to pitch in. So it's kind of that it's a servant leadership. It's kind of like a player coach is also the mentality. Like yeah. I never felt so far removed from, you know, what I was doing in the military, what I want to do is fly, but also kind of coaching and mentoring along the way. Uh, and then I, I think I was rewarded with good success. Like when I approached leadership that way, where I'm just trying to build the team and, and make them stronger, I saw it. I mean, I saw firsthand they would do better, right? So you got to have goals and you got to have standards and you have to, but you have to give them the resources and you have to encourage them. And, and, and leadership is as much an art as is a science in that regard. So I tried to approach it like I'm a player coach, meaning that I should be able to do whatever they're doing. Um, more importantly, I need to make sure they can do their jobs better. Um, and when they're on the field, they're on the flight tech wherever they have, you know, in the air that they have all the tools and they know that they've, that I've got their back. And so it wasn't, I mean, I, you know, we weren't all unlike some stuff in special forces where everyone's on a first name basis, there's still a traditional hierarchy and rank sure. structure within the military. Um, it, sometimes to a default, which meant that I had to go out of my way to do all I could to be approachable and, and, mm -hmm. and find that. I also found incredible value. You know, when you're in charge of an aircraft carrier, and you need to make decisions. I mean, you're kind of insulated, right? You're getting told, I mean, I had 20 direct, re, you know, department heads as we call them and they would give me information and but everything gets you know filtered you know the more layers you have and i i wanted to know like all the way down the deck plate you know who's like the, the new kid that checked in from texas how is he doing yeah. you know what's what are we doing well or not and because knowing that again the, the team mentality mm -hmm. life's a team sport well how is that teammate doing and 
I couldn't always get it unless I was actually doing that. So I would spend a lot of time, you know, if I wasn't flying or on the bridge or doing other stuff, just walking around trying to talk to people and just, you know, just start off. Hey, what's going on? Where are you from? You know, let's talk about, talk about football. Let's talk about, you know, the 49ers being the best football team ever. And then they they <laughs> banter and say, no, no, it's not. Yeah. Um, and I enjoyed that because in the end of the day, right. You know, the military is all going to be behind us where that's just who we are at the moment. And it's some incredible groundwork. The end, end of the day, we're still just, you know, men or women that all have served their country. We just have to be different positions. So I always try to approach it from that. And we're all, you know, we're all equal. They're just, some have more rank, some have more authority and, you know, we're all on the same team. So the, co- the player coach mentality was always something I kind of strive for. And, uh, and meaning that if we're going to get up early in PT, well, then I'm going to get up there in PT mm-hmm. and if we're going to run. I better be able to run as fast as them. And, um, you know, things like that, I think that were important. Um, and, and it allowed me to, communicate with them in a way almost like a peer to peer, even though we know there's structure there. We know that in the, the day he's the captain. So he can decide where the ship goes. Yeah. Um, but I, I just felt like I learned more. I got better feedback and, uh, and I saw the benefits of that. I mean, I saw the tangible results of that, you know, the, that we did better at things. We did better on the exercises. We did better on our events, you know, our, our ship looked better. And I think it ties to, you know, trying to approach it that way and, and try to share that. Cause if it wasn't just me, I mean, if I was the only one, in leadership position doing that, then yeah. it's going to fall in deaf ears. But, sure. but, you know, talking about the importance of that, talking about the importance of culture and, and why that matters. And we've seen it, right? We've all been in commands where, man, the culture sucks and you're just counting yeah. days. You're like, man, yeah. when do I leave this command? Yeah. Or when do I go home today? Um, you're not giving your all, yeah. you know that. So if you build the right culture, I mean, this is the whole culture, you know, versus schema thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, I'd rather have a, good culture than a good plan. Cause I can, cause we know the plan is going to fall apart anyways, but if you have the good culture, you know, when the bullets start flying, you're going to be able to fill in from one another cause you're all mm-hmm. fighting for the same reason. And you yeah. have that culture. You want to be part of it. Yeah. And, uh, it, we were, I was just talking about this. Actually, we were just talking about this. Uh, there we were. Um, consensus matters. Like people would say like, well, I'm right. So it doesn't matter what everybody else thinks, but yeah. like consensus matters. Like if you yeah. don't have people behind you standing to the left or right, are going to follow you. It doesn't matter if you're great. If you consider yeah. yourself a great leader, and it doesn't matter if you're right, you have to have those yeah. people that are willing to follow you. I mean, there's so many famous people, you know, military historians, Napoleons that say it's, you know, with the right morale, you can overcome any other obstacle. Right. So this isn't just about let's have a easy, fun place to work. It's, it's because there's a, you know, as a result of that, you will be better war fighters, right? Cause you're going to, you're going to work harder. You're part of the team. You, you, you know, you understand what you're trying to accomplish. You have a clear mission. It's like, you know, and I knew it, I, I could feel it. Like, when, you know, when I built that right culture on any ship or squadron I've been in, I had the right resources. We were trained hard because you have to train to be ready for it. But man, I was like, just woe is the person that gets in our way? Because there's no way they're going to be able to overcome us. Like, yeah. We're going to, we're going to dominate them. Not just because it's a $25 billion aircraft carrier, because I have 5,000 people that all want to do the same thing. And yeah. you could take all that away. Give me 5,000 people with pitchforks and we'll, we'll take a small country with that alone. Um, yeah. But that's, that was kind of what I was, I was trying. It's a long answer to your question. No, um, I, I wanted a long answer. Um, well, what yeah, I was striving for. I, I think one of the kind of highlights of, to me, of your leadership was, uh, was during COVID. And, uh, you know, America more than ever needs people, the principle to stand up, uh, even when, even when it's not the be- in their best interest. And, and, yeah. uh, and, and that's what leaders do. But leaders aren't just in charge, leaders are responsible. Uh, that's what leadership really is, is be, being a person responsible. And sometimes it's a hard thing to do. And, and, uh, and there was an example in COVID where you had to do that. And, and I think, I think a lot of people listening may have already heard the story, but I, I'd yeah. love for you to share it with us. Yeah. And, and, you know, if you think about where we were like March of 2020, you know, I know that, you know, I've, I've since thrown away every mask I've ever had, but back in March of 2020, like when we were as a world trying to figure out what COVID was about, sure. the Roosevelt had pulled into Vietnam, you know, it was the, that was going to be the a chance to surf in Vietnam. And, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then there was an outbreak in Da Nang and then it ultimately spread. And then we likely got some, you know, one or two sailors got exposed to it. So when we were out of sea a couple of weeks later, and there's a whole long backstory to this, but bottom line is we ended up having some positive cases on their care. Um, and it's like the opposite of social distancing, right? You have 5,000 people on this small ship. So when we had one Sharing or two. Sharing meds. Yeah. I mean, I remember like, you know, I remember when we had it, the doc called me like in the middle of the night. He's like, Cap, just so you know, we had two positive cases. And I was like, I mean, there, there we go. Cause there's, that's it. Cause we knew it wasn't two, right. We yeah. knew it was likely to be 10, 20 and we didn't know enough about it. We just had, you know, the case studies at the time where the cruise ship in Japan where like 17 people died. Yeah. Um, and they were, now they were older, but that was a cruise ship where you could quarantine people in their own state rooms. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so I'm like, man, this is, we, and we just don't know, you know, I knew my crew was healthy. I knew they were strong. 
they were, you know, they're resilient, but I just didn't know what, you know, what was going to happen with this. Cause no one did. Uh, we, we all know a lot more now about it. Um, sure. but at the time pre vaccine, and we didn't even have masks. So long story short, we pulled into Guam, we made a beeline for Guam because I knew that once you get the ship pier side somewhere in the U S territory, like Guam, and I can stand down the reactor. So I don't worry about flight operations. It kind of depressurize the situation. And then I can get people off the ship. I can put them on the pier, the flight deck. Cause as we know, Sometimes fresh air is about the best thing you can get, right? Get some mm. sunshine and yeah. get outside. So I actually moved the gym from the ship onto the pier. Um, and I was letting nice. people work out and, um, you know, and so we went through all the stuff we kind of mitigated, but the goal was to get the ship pier side, let people spread out. And then all, meanwhile, try to test and do all we could. Um, like any big bureaucracy, the military was trying to figure out what to do with it. Like the world was. And I was just getting frustrated because we were having these constant deliberations about, you know, what are we going to do next? How are we going to do it? And I'm like, I need to get, I need more space. Like you're only giving me a little bit of the pier and my ship with 5,000 people. This is going to spread. And statistically, you know, I think the world fatality was 4%. Well, 4% of 5,000 people is a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, even 1% is too many people. The answer is zero. Um, and so as a leader in charge with, you know, with that great power comes great responsibility to, to take a quote from Spider-Man. I knew that, man, I just got to do all I can. I got to drive to that zero because that's the right answer. And then we'll see what happens. And so I, I was getting pushed back and not, in, I would argue it's not necessarily intentional. It's just the idea that we're going to think through this problem. And, and it goes back to, what we talked about Magazi, like people were sitting around trying to solve the problem and I just wanted to take action. Like I knew what I needed to do, which is like, give me more space. Give me, give me a hotel room or two or three since Guam was empty with 10,000 empty beds. Give me a couple areas. And, and there was this kind of slow, deliberate planning process. We were, you know, the U.S. military has an incredible logistics system, right? Best in the world. It's just slow to get started. And once you get started, you can do anything. You can overcome any obstacle. It was slow. And I needed quick action. And I mean, I was at the point of, you know, we had discussions about, well, let's just break down the gate and let's just march downtown and take over a hotel. And I'm like, well, okay, we'll put that on the list. It's not, you know. <laughs> not off the list. Yeah. Not completely yeah, it's off the list. It's not off the yeah. list. Yeah. I said, you know, that could be, that could have a lot of challenges, you know, but, um, End of the day, so I, I, I sent what's called a red flare. So you know, in the military, that's a special term. Uh, well, it's like see if you have a you have a mishap or you have an emergency, mm-hmm. you shoot a red flare. Like in in training, if a submarine takes a fake shot, like a torpedo shot on a ship, they'll shoot a green flare. So it's like, hey, we're no distress. We're just telling you we shot you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you never want to see a green flare either. But a red flare is a signal of distress. So if you're in a lifeboat or you eject and you're in the water, every flare you have is going to be red. So that's kind of international for see a red flare, somebody needs help. Yeah. Um, so I didn't call it a red flare. I just sent a letter with a case study and I said to my, my superiors, Hey, we got to do something like we are sitting on our hands here longer than we need to. And if we don't take action, then it's going to have the worst effect. Right. And we, we are, you know, we were overthinking this. Let's just take some quick action. Let's take the hotel rooms, which is all we did in the end. I just needed to happen quicker. I wasn't, I just wasn't being patient. Um, and so I sent the email essentially is what happened. And I, you know, I was getting pushed back, but I finally sent the email with a lot of consensus. And I had, you know, to th- throw a little more context to it. I had a, you know, have a incredible medical team on the ship that's doing all the analysis for me. You have an epi- epidemiology team that's been flown in. So I have, it's not like I'm making this decision on Google. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like there's a lot of analysis that goes into it. And, uh, and the email was too. Email went to like my boss, my boss's boss and one layer up. They're all aviators. In fact, I addressed it to, you know, I basically said, as fellow aviators, you guys are combat driven, right? You are, you are take action kind of folks. Uh, and I need your help now more than ever. And these are guys I drunk beer with and yeah, flew yeah. with and stuff. So, uh, and, and they did exactly what I asked. It just, in the end that, as you know, email is going to get out and, um, and it did, but, but I was at a point in my career where, you know, I, I needed to, to, to walk the talk as it were, mm-hmm. you know, if I understand that my number one priority as a leader is to take care of your people, to you know, to take care of them, to support them so they can do the things we ask them to do, which is go into combat and risk their lives. Then when it matters, you know, I, I had, I thought I had two options, right? I could have sat there and said, okay, well, let's see, we play it out. But, but you know, as a, I don't want to risk my career or, you know what, I don't want to leave anything on the table. Like, like, I don't want this to go south and lose 20 sailors and go, man, I knew it was going to happen. I mean, I knew exactly what's going to happen. Like, I would not have been able to lose myself. So it became kind of a, a conscious versus career moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I mean, I, and I was pretty clear. I mean, I knew the risks. I mean, and I, people ask me like, did you know you're going to get fired? I, I mean, I've been in the military long enough to know that 
when you send an email to your boss and your boss's boss and four star admirals, someone's going to get pissed, right? At, at some point. And, yeah. but I was also like, man, if, if this ends my career, then so be it. I mean, I'm doing it for what I believe is the most important reason. And I feel strong enough in my conviction that I know it's the right thing to do. And so it doesn't really matter what happens. I don't mm -hmm. care anymore. I would, but I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to protect my career and, and push that risk down to the sailors. So long story short, I think we got the help we needed. Um, we got sailors moved off the ship. We got them out in town. We got them in the hotel rooms. Um, the secretary of the Navy at the time, who's a political appointee, um, was a little frustrated with my action. And, and he's, and to be fair, like we actually communicate now. Um, and he, I understand he, where he was at the time. I understand why he was frustrated mm -hmm. and I totally understand where he was. He just, he made the decision to fire me and then he came out to the ship and then had some, he was angry and had some disparaging things to say. So, you know, this all then plays out in, <laughs> in the public arena, right? Like right. I remember calling Mary from the ship right after I'd been fired, you know, cause I hadn't took me all day to pack up, but, um, but I remember calling her from my phone. Uh, we were in, in Guam, you know, mm -hmm. the email had gotten out, people understood, Hey, there's something going on. Let's get some help. And I go, Hey, just, just so you know, I just got fired. She goes, she goes, it's been on CNN for like two hours. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so I flip it on. I'm like, Oh yeah, look. Yeah. And then, so it became what I, what I did not anticipate was how quickly this would become a yeah. uh, spectacle publicly. Yeah. And, and it, you know, there's a, there's politics involved and that's, you know, if you can predict how that stuff plays out politically, then you're probably the one person in the U.S. that understands politics that well. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I always, but again, I don't care. Even now, knowing how it played out, I, I still like to think I would send the email and ask for help when I knew we needed it. More importantly, when the sailors needed it. Sure. Um, so that ended, yeah. So it took the, you know, like I said, the best job I'd ever had. Um, fly a helicopter, fly a fighter off my own ship, drive the ship around South China Sea, get pizza whenever I wanted because, you know, <laughs> I had people taking care of me. Um and it was a good team. More importantly, it was a team that I just felt like I had spent a lot of time building, uh, that we understood the common goal of the mission. And I, you know, if there's any regret I had, it was that I was leaving this team as they were about to fight through COVID and what was going to have to happen yeah. and have to deal with that. And so my only regret was that, you know, I, I pushed it to the limit where I got fired. Uh, and that meant I had to leave before that fight began. Right. right? And that's, you know, that was my regret, but I also knew that they had people that were going to step up and I trained them well. And so, so they gave me a, a nice public send off when I left the ship. And in that day, they all came out and gave me like a, a rousing send off that I'll never sure. forget. Um, yeah. And so that's something, that's one of the other moments in my life that I'll never, you know, I'll never forget. And, um, but I like, again, I'd like to think I wouldn't do anything different now because I was doing it for the reasons that I knew were important to me as a leader. Yeah. And I knew, I mean, we time resilience. I knew that I had a strong family back home. I knew that my faith was strong. I was healthy. Uh, all that COVID, but you know, the time, but I had all these pillars set up strongly so that I think when you face those challenges in life, if you put the money in the bank, as it were, and you built that resiliency or spent some time, well, then these things aren't going to phase you. I mean, yeah, make you, you know, you can be angry or whatever, but end of the day, you've built the foundation you need to then ideally make the right decision and then stand by it and not have to second guess it. The Navy may have fired Captain Brett Crozier, but his sailors would not let him go quietly. Chanting his name, sailors swarmed to say goodbye to Crozier, who sounded the alarm about a growing coronavirus outbreak on board the USS Theodore Roosevelt. Before departing, Crozier turned to wave farewell. Earlier this week, he begged Navy leaders to help the ship's crew in a letter first reported by the San Francisco Chronicle. We are not at war, he wrote. Sailors do not need to die. I mean, what was that like? What, I mean, these guys are chanting your name. Yeah, it was... Um it kind of brought everything to a close, right? Like it was, it was one thing to, when we were looking at the possible options and solutions and then sending the email and, and understanding exactly what I said that, you know, if we were, and I think I said this in email too, I said, you know, if we were going to go into combat, then obviously even now we would pull the lines, we'd go to sea and, and what would be the foe that would challenge us, right? Because we have a strong team and we'll fight through COVID and all the things that might, you know, as a result of that, but we're not, there isn't a war going on. So my priorities were obviously to take care of the sailors. It wasn't, you know, no one had asked them to sign up to serve their country and risk their lives because of COVID and because we wouldn't take the step. So, so that's why I felt pretty strong about it, but all that doesn't matter. It wasn't until I probably got out to the hangar that, you know, and I saw that and I got that send up. It was kind of one of those moments that kind of hit you home. Right. And, yeah. and I, and I definitely had COVID at that point, but that wasn't, you know, if there was ever a time through all that where I was like, man, I just need to take a knee and take us all in. It was probably then, but, yeah. um, you know, and, they were, they were a strong team. 
And, and they went on and did amazing stuff. They, we got them off the ship. They went to hotel rooms. And then in short order, they came back on the ship and they got to, went to sea and they started flying again, right? Un, under all the COVID protocols that yeah. we, we got familiar with. So, and I knew they would. And uh, you know, again, my only regret was I couldn't be there to help them through that. But, but I also felt confident I trained them to, to handle that. And they did. They did exactly that. Yeah. So um, was that your exit from the Navy as well? No, and, and this is a good, it's a good follow-up because um, I was in the Navy for another two years after that. Okay. So big Navy or the politics as it were. So the, the, the Navy itself, even after I had been fired by the acting sector of the Navy, they had a plan to reinstate me. So when I was in Guam going through quarantine, because I couldn't fly back until I was neg- tested negative, um, they said, hey, we're going to put you back in command. Like we think the decision to fire you was made, it was a mistake. So up to the CNO was, we're going to put you back in. So I had, I had actually drafted a letter. I had a, a PAO that helped me write the letter and it was going to be brief to the sec def and the president that week. And the secretary of defense at the time, when he got that brief, he said, I don't think this is what we want to do right now. So go back and take another look at it. So, so after that was two weeks after that, um, April 14th or so, when I, when I thought there was a chance I was going to be put back on the ship, which would have been the first time ever they had fired a captain and then put mm. him back on. So it would have been a big decision. Um, but I felt, I felt honored that the CNO and everybody had taken the time to look yeah. at it. Um, cause remember that the secretary of Navy got fired, like, you know, shortly after this whole thing, cause he yeah. came out the ship and said stupid things and then that got recorded. And so he was, Congress asked for his, his resignation. Mm. Um, but the Navy was going to put me back in. So when I, what, when the decision was made, Hey, let's hold off on that. Now I'm like, all right, well, you, know, you don't get two chances of this, right? Yeah. Like yeah. now we don't like your first answer. Like go back, come yeah, back yeah, with a different yeah. answer. I will say though that naval aviation took good care of me. And this is where I call, you know, my, my brotherhood or sisterhood, you know, I got back to San Diego, um, at, you know, they had reached out to my family. They take, you know, they'd reached out to make sure they're doing okay. I came back to San Diego. I had a great job. I worked for the, Ad- the Admiral, you know, no, three-star Admiral. No NJPs or anything like no, that. Nothing. nothing like that. No, I mean, I had a, I had this, you know, obviously a black asterisk next to my yeah. name, meaning that you yeah. will not promote, um, but basically I did two more years. So I, cause I wanted to hit my 30 year mark, like 30 years to the day was my mm. goal. Um, cause I could have left early. Um, so I worked hard. I had a great job. I lived in San Diego. My oldest son was an air crewman. So he was jumping out of helicopters out in the bay. My middle son was a student and I would go up to Lamore, California. And I kept, I was flying. I so I still got to fly super Hornets as an instructor now one week a month until like the month I retired. So I look back at it, like, you know, Politics are what they are, and I, no one can really control those. Um, I, you know, I made the decision I did because I know my number one priority is leader is take care of your people, and I felt like in the end, naval aviation specifically because that's my that's my tribe inside the Navy. They did all they could to take care of me, um, awesome. and you know, so three star admirals there in my retirement. You know, I got to my you know had a last helicopter flight in the Sierras and followed by a last Super Hornet flight around the Bay yeah. Area. I got to fly with my middle son in my back seat of a Super Hornet when he was doing a midshipman cruise. So mm-hmm. There's some yeah. key moments that happened in the last two years that I think um, that I, I look back on and, and give them credit and feel feel like the family didn't turn their back on me. If that makes sense. You yeah. Know, that I was still, no matter how it unfolded, you know, publicly at the height of COVID. Closing question. Um, not everybody's going to be a commander of a nuclear aircraft carrier, but- in life, people you know find themselves in this similar situation, different circumstances all the time. Uh, what would you say to someone that's you know has to make the right decision, knowing this would be personal cost, uh, whether it's in their home, their family, their community, or their their yeah. Job? No, it's a great question. Um, I always think a lot about. It. I mean, I think if you're making the right decision for the right reason, mm-hmm. then almost nothing else matters. The consequences of not making the right decision, especially when you know it's the right decision, are far greater. On, on you personally and your resiliency as it were, you know, than it is by, you know, taking a decision, making the right decision, even if you know it's going to come at personal cost. Yeah. So don't sell yourself short, meaning that if you make the decision for the right reason, I, I you know, and you've spent time on the mind, body, spirit, all the stuff we've talked about today, that you'll be able to weather that better than you think, because you're going to have friends and family there to help you. Physically, you're going to be strong and get through that. Mentally, You've been through transitions and you challenge yourself so you can, and spiritually, you're going to have something to rely on, you know, somebody to rely on that'll help you get through that. Yeah. So even though those moments might feel dark and you feel like you're about to step off by yourself, you're never alone. Yeah. And if you spent the time and you put that money in the bank of resiliency, you're going to be able to cash in on some of that and you'll come out the other end probably even stronger than when you face that initial challenge. Yeah. Super wise words, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. We appreciate you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you. 
I know we want to plug your book. Uh, we already talked about it again, but uh, surf, surf when you can. Uh, Captain Brett Kozier, uh, you guys definitely get a copy of this book. It's incredible. Not just a story, a story, but some amazing leadership principles. Yeah, I think I don't you, know. Yeah, uh, you get it where books are sold. I see we have a website. Uh, the, the website is a uh, uh, Team Step USA. No, this that, Team Step is uh, something that's the, separate. That's, that's okay. separate. Yeah. yeah, but Amazon's got it. But yeah, yeah you go to Amazon to get the book. Uh, but. Yeah, it's on Audible. Um, you can get it on Amazon, wherever books are sold, like you, you're saying. You read it on Audible? I do. So if you want okay. more of my voice, there you have to. Yeah. Or if you yeah. don't, then just buy the book. <laughs> it's actually good for, for those who are listening. It's a good listen. But tell us, Chubb's mentioning Team Step USA. This is something you're working on right now. It's something else we want to highlight. So share share a little bit about what Yeah, I'd love to, and I appreciate that. Um, so my first year after I got in the military, I worked as the Chief Operating Officer of Veterans Village of San Diego, and we dealt with homeless veterans in San Diego County. Um, which we all know there's a huge homeless population yeah. and, you know, half a million plus in the U S and about 7% of those are veterans. So for a year, I spent time trying to help veterans, which tend to be more senior folks struggling with mental health, huge financial problems, legal problems, and obviously some, some drug problems. Um, and it was good and it was rewarding work and a chance to work with veterans and some old salty guys and some young kids that needed to help. Um, very rewarding. I felt my only downside was I felt like we were just kind of playing whack-a-mole trying to, you know, trying to treat the symptoms. And, and so I, I, I have some other stuff that's going on. I work with a startup company. I do other things on the side, but I pivoted a little bit from hope, you know, dealing on the, the veteran homeless side. And I now work with a company called STEP, which stands for Support the Enlisted Project. It's been around 10 years, uh, started by a former Navy sailor and they do amazing work. And what they try to get at is the root cause of all these problems. Uh, and this ties into resiliency. They focus on the financial wellness of, of sailors that are struggling. Um, so specifically, we focus on E6 and below, all services across the country. Um, when they run into some kind of financial problem, can't pay their rent, can't pay utilities, cars can be repossessed, they can reach out and we will give them a grant. We'll pay it for them, right? Not to them, but direct to the lender. Uh, they don't have to pay it back. But we're going to teach them to fish. We're going to teach them, like we're going to sit down with them with counselors that are trained you know, social workers that also understand finances and say, Hey, how did you get here? Like what, and it's not, we're not judging. We're just like, Hey, you know, unless you want to keep coming back, which we won't do it again. Yeah. You know, how do we prevent this from happening again? And so they, they work them through. It's about 20 hours over the course of the next couple of months of, you know, what are your goals? What are your plans? You know, how do you, how do you get yourself to where you have financial wellness? Uh, which I think is a fundamental root cause of all these other problems. Cause we know that we all, we've all been there when you struggle financially, your marriage has challenges operationally sure. when you're deployed, you're not focused on it. Uh, mental health isn't great. You're physical. So to me, I think this is one area of, of resiliency that obviously needs a lot of focus is the financial wellness side. It's, it's and, so important. You know. Yeah. And, this, and our success rate is like 93%, meaning yeah. that we follow up a year later with measurable metrics in terms of their financial well-being. And making wiser financial yeah, decisions. they're doing amazing stuff. Tell you, like, I'm so thankful to hear you guys doing it on the front end, on the resiliency side, the prevention side. On the back end and the recovery side, like when we have guys come through our recovery program, Mighty Oaks, we have 14 core classes that, that we take them through on the recovery yeah. side. And two of them are, are related to this. One is how to manage your time and other is how to manage your money. And people might think, what's that have to do with PTSD and exactly? yeah. everything? If you're trying to it's a lot. put 26 hours in a 24-hour day and you're already dealing with frustrations and anxiety – it's going to go yeah. bad. If you're, if you're, you know, living outside of your means and putting that pressure, like you're already dealing with anxiety and stress. So I think this is super, yeah. super important. And the fact that you guys are doing it on the front end is, is something we're not doing. I'm, I love yeah, seeing it's been real work. successful. And we, we partner with other major nonprofit stuff and we should, we could talk more about it later, yeah. but I, yeah. I think it's great. And I think what I'm seeing is again, it's, it's not just having enough money. It's because, you know, we all have people with money have problems too. Sure. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's how do you, how do you balance that? You know, what are your yeah. goals? How do you spend it? What do you spend yeah. it on? What's important to you? And it all kind of comes together, right. As to with life goals and your mind, pies, all this stuff matters. I think, you know, we, we sometimes overlook the finance piece, you know, although even though we know that junior enlisted don't get paid a lot uh, yeah. and we ask them to do a lot and we move them to high cost of living areas like San Diego. Yeah. And I can tell you as a captain of a ship, when I have a 20 year old person driving the ship, I don't want them focused on anything else other than not hitting the ship next to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I think there's an operational readiness piece too, to this. So we've got a lot of support. Uh, it's growing pretty quickly. Uh, a lot of it can be done virtually. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we focus on San Diego, but we help about a thousand folks every year. And mm -hmm. in some cases we just give them food and stuff they might need short term, but long term, our goal is to sit down with them, do a financial wellness training with them mm -hmm. and get them up and running. And then we'll teach them to fish. And, and we found that, that really is addressing a, the root cause of a lot of these problems. 
and uh, and we're, we're having huge effects. So Heck yeah, Veterans Village was focused on the symptoms. Important, great work. My hats off to all the folks that do that. This is uh, STEP, Support the Enlisted Project, which is teamstepusa.org. Um, they do a great job, I think, of addressing the core yeah. root cause of a lot of these things. Yeah, and people one, can, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, people can support uh, Team Step if they just go to the go Yeah, to the, so go to the website. I mean, obviously, as you know, nonprofits are always trying to raise money to do that. We have a pretty good financial report so people get the information they need on it. Um, if you're in the San Diego area, we have an office in Washington as well, and we're expanding those opportunities to kind of pitch in and do some, you know, we do community facing things like food drives and stuff like that as well for the junior enlisted. But uh, yeah, check it out. Go to the website and teamstepusa.org and then uh, throw some dollars, throw yeah. some time, at least get smart on it. We're trying to do because our goal is to grow and be more impactful. Your, wi- your wife's company one more time to make sure. Uh, client cloud care. Client cloud care.com. So okay. she, yeah. So if you're any, a, any veterans or yeah, uh, if you're a veteran military spouse and you, uh, you know, a little about Salesforce, yeah. uh, she's always, she's always looking for good talent. All right. Nice. We got some gifts. Uh, Awesome. Yeah. We always uh, have a little swag bag. Yeah. Uh, so, so one is a, a Mighty Oak shirt. Um, here, let's see. Uh, Love it. Mighty Oaks cap. It's a good cap, man. That's yeah, it is a good cap. cap. Thank you. And it's some of our books. Uh, so we have a three book was a three book uh, resiliency series. We give these out to active duty service members uh, in our in our resiliency events. In fact, you know, I always talk about. It. I've spoke to over about a half million troops on base around the world, and these we give them these books, and we've given away about four hundred thousand copies. Wow. Of these. So we we sell them. Uh, they are also available for free, even outside the military. If you want to, for the people that want to download the uh, uh, version, but Path to Resiliency, Truth About PTSD, and Not the Solution, Winning the Battle Against Suicide. So these are books that we That's give great. our troops, and then an unfair advantage is one of my main books. It gets Mighty Oaks flyer stickers, and then Saving Aziz is a uh, uh, oh nice about you know uh, the Afghan evacs and my my role in that with a uh, with Saving Aziz. So you, know. you got picture. Yeah, I'm an aviator. I need pictures. Too. No, no, we actually, we actually are going to get picture some pictures. Book. Thomas Nelson didn't want to put pictures and everybody's asked about that. So we're going <laughs> to, when they redo the, uh, the paper copy and the movie version, cause this will be made in a film. Uh, they're, oh, yeah. they're going to put a page in the back with a link to uh, actually, uh, like folders. That's awesome. Online, Thank you very much. Pictures. And then, uh, one thing that we got, cause we have some amazing sponsors for the show. Uh, our, our, Main one of my main sponsors, Midas Gold Group, a veteran owned uh, precious metals company and uh, gold and silver. I'm a big believer in the, yeah. uh, when the zombies come. We, That's right. Uh, you can have your Bitcoin, but if you can't get to gold it, you got to have gold and silver. So, gold and yeah, bullets. Bullet, gold, yeah, gold, silver, and bullets. Just say so. This is uh, the American Eagle. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, silver, uh, one ounce of silver. And that's a gift yeah. from Midas Gold Group. And anybody listening, by the way, if you want uh, free silver, Go to MidasGoldGroup.com. Mention my name. You'll get some free silver. And uh, How can you not want free silver? Yeah, exactly. I don't, I don't understand <laughs> how you're not. But yeah, all you got to do is contact MidasGoldGroup. That's awesome. Uh, dot com. Mention my name. You get yeah. free silver. And uh, they're awesome guys. So yeah, great to sure. have you on, brother. Uh, appreciate yeah, my pleasure. your yeah, service pleasure. and what you do. And it's just a real honor to have you here. Yeah, great conversation so, today. Absolutely. And thanks for what you guys are doing as well. Yeah, so, absolutely. Oh, well, yeah. All right. Till next time. What's up, guys? Sean here, one of your hosts at Resilient. Thank you for watching the show. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any bonus content in future episodes. We have some amazing guests that share their story of resilience, and you won't want to miss it.